Good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for this year. Um, the first item on the agenda, item one, is a decision for the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, may I ask all those in the public gallery and present to switch any electrical devices off or to silent that might interfere with proceedings. And uh, today we have our first evidence session on our business support inquiry. And I would like to welcome uh, our witnesses who have come in today uh, from my left to right. Uh, first of all, Lynn Cadenhead, who is Chair of Women's Enterprise Scotland. Matt Lancashire, Director of Policy and Public Affairs at SCDI. Susan Love, Policy Manager uh, for the Federation of Small Businesses. And Liz Cameron, Chief Executive, Scottish Chamber of Commerce. So welcome to all four of you. Thank you for coming in today to the committee. Um, if I might just start before we move on to other committee members' questions with a, a fairly uh, general question, which is, in the decade following the transfer of business gateway to local authorities, what are your views on the effectiveness of business support provision to SMEs at a local level, and specifically in terms of the provision provided, whether it's face-to-face -face or digital, specific support for rural businesses um, and coverage of advisors across Scotland. Um, who would like to come in on that question first of all? If you want to, throughout today's proceedings, just indicate by raising your hand. Um, no need, of course, to come in, all of you, on every question, but see how we progress as the session <laughs> proceeds. Liz Cameron, thank you. Um, okay, let me try and um, just d d dissect your four, your four questions. Thank you. In terms of, I think, the, you're right, and I had the honour of um, chairing the transfer over from um, Business Gateway Services from Scottish Enterprise to COSLA 10 years ago, and um, therefore I'm quite aware of some of the challenges in the early days of that transfer in terms of um, lack of resources uh, and also lack of understanding of exactly what support services were around then. Um, if I fast forward to today, um, uh, there, um, there is Business Gateway. If we didn't have Business Gateway model delivering what it's doing today, we would have to look at reinventing it in some form and some manner because we have both Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise absolutely focusing on um, their, their particular geographical areas. But at a particular local level, Business Gateway is actually fulfilling that role in terms of business support services, albeit the model might not be right, and we can have a further discussion about that shortly, but um, it is fulfilling a gap in the market, albeit I mean, it's time, I think, that the committees recognise time to revisit that model. In terms of the rural support um, uh, in particular, um, I was actually in Murray uh, last week and I was actually talking to both the Chamber and the Business Gateway uh, Support Service there. Um, I think that we're, we're, we need to be, when you're revisiting a model, we need to consider what's happening with um, city alliances, what's happening with um, other local deals that's being done, because we've got to look at whether we can um, integrate or collaborate better the support services for particular start-up and growth businesses as well. And I'm highlighting growth businesses because they're quite important to the local communities that they're serving. So I think that, that's, that we should be taking a wider, a wider view in terms of the business support service because we actually do have a pretty um, strong ecosystem around business support services. The, one of the problems with that is that from a business community's perspective, it is very, very difficult to actually get to the right type of service and to the right product to fit our growth businesses. And, and may I ask, with regard to city deals, what steps have been taken to uh, work together with it, these from the point of view of um, business uh, gateway support? I can't, I don't feel as if I'm uh, competent to answer that question. I think that's a question for business gateway and local authorities. But that said, I would have assumed but perhaps wrongly, that where um, there's a strategy and action plan for the city alliances and for the other rural areas, um, that um, there is collaboration and development going on as we speak in terms of what type of business support service does a local community need, and it does vary from uh, region to region. 
Well, I'll come now to Matt Lancashire. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, <coughs> first, I'd like to say probably that, that the brand of Business Great Way since the transfer 10 years ago is, is very strong and very well known uh, across the business community and business sectors. And I think that's a starting point. It's a real positive in that sense. And uh, I think, you know, there, there's been a... A, a divergence in performance across local authorities. It's a very mixed bag in terms of our members uh, thinking and evidence back to us on, on the support they receive. Um, there's also, to an extent, we've not seen really any difference between local authorities who've kept the service in-house to those who've gone towards a more external provider model uh, going forward too. I think some of the key issues are I raise look at the service provision of SC in the agencies against Business Gateway and also whether there's an isolated approach, i.e. is there an alignment between what the agencies are doing in certain areas and Business Gateway to provide the best support for a business moving forward. And I think that alignment piece is pretty critical to any new model that, that comes forward and comes out. I also think Business Gateway have been operating in a quite challenging fiscal period over the past 10 years for local authorities, which is in, in itself has, has had a wee bit of a burden on the service provision that it can actually provide and, and to what ends it can do as well. I also think that the uh, coming from our members, and, and Liz has quite rightly touched on it, is a lot of members uh, are associated with the support for Business Gateway are early stage businesses so they're not established businesses they're not people who've been on the block three four five years there's a less lesser demand for business gateway from members that are established and certainly in scdi's membership and actually that support's needed particularly if we look towards aligning with things like the esr review and we talk about scale up of businesses and the support that's needed to achieve that across scotland maybe business gateway can play more of a direct role there and and the two last, well, the last point on was the digital side, and, and, and rural, again, goes back to that differentiation between what you might get in Dumfries and Galloway may be very different to the provision that you get in Highlands and Islands, and, and that might be something to do with high and support offered there too. But in terms of digital, I think that that is a weakness of Business Gateway, where a number of members suggest that Business Gateway doesn't offer tailored digital support service to to enable their business to become digital or move on and push forward and i think that's a critical aspect of any new model is that our business businesses are changing fourth industrial revolution is upon us what is businesses what is business gateway going to do in terms of demands for support for digital services are, are there any other um, improvements to uh, marketing and awareness of business gateway services that could be implemented I think I touched on it a little bit where I said there's a real complex landscape of business support services, whether that might be Scottish Enterprise or Business Gateway. There's, it's great that there's so many entry points, but at the same time, it doesn't seem like there's a one-stop shop. So, you know, there should be a kind of uh, no wrong door approach to business support. So whether you go in SC, you might get directed to Business Gateway. If you go in Business Gateway, your support might be over here. And at the moment that alignment doesn't seem to be coming through from what our members suggest. Uh, Susan Love. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I'll just give sort of a general um, remarks at this point, and I'm sure we'll go into further detail about different aspects, such as delivery in rural areas or digital support. Um, I think the first thing to say is just recognising the history of some of the issues we're talking about. And when we were thinking about preparing our submission for committee, um, we went back and had a look at previous inquiries into business support and actually challenges around the complex nature and cluttered landscape of business support was one of the first inquiries undertaken by the Enterprise and Lifelong Learning Committee uh, back 1999-2000 and from that came the recommendation that we need a one-stop shop for business support. So exactly as Liz said, if we didn't have Gateway, we would ultimately end up back at a place where we said that we need to have this one-stop shop. And that's backed up by similar inquiries, for example, in Wales a few years ago where they set up Business Wales. And there have been similar calls about the current support structure um, 
in England. So I think it's important to recognise the value of that national advisory service, irrespective of who's delivering it. Um, the next thing is to think about the context over those 10 years and what's happened. And I think it was particularly unfortunate that um, local government took over um, transformation of Business Gateway exactly at the point at which recession uh, hit. And you know, we, we all remember um, that at the point at which that transition was happening, there was quite a difficult time in terms of rethinking the products and advice and services um, that businesses needed because the demand completely changed and businesses went from thinking about growth to retrenchment. So that you know, was an added context that, that I think we need to think about when we're talking about the transition. Um, in terms of um, sort of has it has it improved? Has it got worse over the last ten years? Um, hot off the press, we've just done some polling work with our members asking about Business Gateway because the uptake of this sort of varies in different surveys over the years. Now, our latest survey, um, which is of, of just under two hundred businesses, showed that sixty four percent of our members had used Business Gateway services in the last two years. Now, I'm sure our membership are probably more engaged perhaps than the, the wider business population but that, that's a tremendous awareness and engagement um, statistic for, for a business support service when we know that most businesses don't use business support and of them three quarters over three quarters found it a helpful service so I think it, it's worth bearing in mind that the engagement and awareness has generally improved in all of the surveys and quality assurance done by Gateway, there's a generally high satisfaction rate. So from that perspective, it's a fairly solid service and a good principle that I think most of us would agree with. However, there are a number of aspects around how the service is delivered that we might want to reflect upon in terms of, you know, which types of business or business owner or sector or place we might support differently, how we might deliver that support, how we go about the monitoring and reporting and setting of targets, um, and how the service is run itself um, from a governance and accountability perspective. Lynn Cadenhead. Thank you. Um, so Women's Enterprise Scotland has been fortunate enough to be doing quite a lot of international work recently within Europe and also in terms of uh, policy development for the G20. So at the outset, I would like to say that uh, we're actually incredibly fortunate in Scotland when I see the level of support that is already available for businesses compared to other countries uh, throughout Europe. We really are in a very fortunate position. However, you know, as with all things, uh, room for improvement. Um, the uh, business survey results that came out with, with the paper um, today were, were incredibly useful. However, I would like to highlight that there's no gender disaggregated data provided with this paper, so it's very difficult for me to comment uh, on specific issues from that research uh, for, for females. Um, very much broadly in line with everyone else who's spoken spoken to date, you know, generally the services of Business Gateway are, are deemed to be supportive, useful, uh, helpful, um, but uh, there's considerable level of inconsistency in terms of the type and style of support across different geographical regions. And also there is a dependency, um, there's a bit of an issue if you're in one area you might get one level of support and one area you might get a different type of support. I'd like also to share with you an example of a, a female who, was, who lived in one business gateway area uh, worked in another business gateway area in a part-time job and wanted to set up a business. However, she was not allowed to go to the area where she worked, which was more convenient for her to be able to get support in order to be able to set up her business. She couldn't go for business gateway support in the area that she actually lived in because when she lived in that area, she was looking after her child. So fundamentally, um, she was not able to get support in a manner that was consistent and appropriate to her needs from Business Gateway. And as a result, the business has got, not gone anywhere. And uh, you know, that's really unfortunate. So I think these are some of the issues that need to be, uh, be teased out. So it's inconsistency in uh, you know, level, levels of support. We have um, feedback from people who say that the support that they've had from a Business Gateway advisor has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, 
to the other extreme where they would not recommend Business Gateway to anyone because they felt discriminated against and not supported. Fundamentally, that comes down to the quality of the business advisor uh, individual, and we are seeking to see some kind of you know, accreditation or, or standards uh, implemented across Business Gateway advisors. Right. We'll come to Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I'm hearing a positive endorsement for the principle of a one-stop shop, but as Lynn started to tease out that there are clearly differences in geographical experience. Now, some would describe that as a postcode lottery. Um, do you think that's a, a, a fair description of what's going on in Business Gateway at the moment? Are there some areas that are best perceived to be better than others? Let's I, I, I would say yes, um, and, and that's clearly indicated um, by a lot of the survey and anecdotal evidence that we all pick up, and um, that we're quite clear that if we are looking at it as a, a Scottish-based service, um, there are there are um, if we can actually you know look at as Lynn indicated there, you know what is the quality standards, what is it we're trying to achieve for Scotland for a moment, and then what is the contribution that each of our uh, local areas and communities can, can, can contribute to that economic growth, because all areas are very, very different. Um, and that's I think that's one of the strengths of having um, a business gateway type service, because it should be driven by local needs, by what local business community needs, what the local business opportunities could be. So there's, there's strengths in having the, the, the sort of um, I say national focus, but that national focus must be clear what it is we are trying to achieve. And we are, I think we're all quite clear that, and you see that with surveys, the KPIs and the targets that are set are completely out of date. We are being driven, and, and I picked this up in the work we were doing through the Enterprise and, 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 and Skills Board as well. The targets that we're looking at, we are playing with numbers, and that's not quality. We've, we've, we've been measuring a lot of our economic performance on some of the wrong data, may, may I suggest. Um, and therefore, that drives human behaviour. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting paid on how many start-up businesses that I'm responsible for doing in Lanarkshire, then that's what I'll go for. Um, so we're driving, as a, inadvertently, because we've got, to, we've got to have some measurement, but we've inadvertently driven it in terms of numbers of start-ups. You know, numbers of growth companies. So therefore, you know, that's where the national focus should be coming in and saying, okay, economically, what are we wanting to achieve here? Is it more jobs? Is it a special type of job? And all of that will vary from local area to local area. So they're, they're really, you know, I think your review, I think we're all saying that we need to revisit what it is we actually are trying to achieve um, and revisit the, the KPIs, as we're calling them in the committee report. Um, and one suggestion that I know that we did put for in our submission about is a measurement on partnership. And I'm talking about true partnership between public and private sector, because we're going to be all facing a situation where we do all have reduced funding, mm -hmm. and that goes for private sector as well. And therefore, can we look very closely? You know, if a measurement is on workshops, you know, in the last year, Business Gateways um, held 25,000 workshops. That's a hell of a lot of workshops. <laughs> Um, eh, and if that's how we're measuring it, then they've done a good job. But, you know, I think that the time of measuring economic impact for Scotland, that's not the right measurements. And therefore, that drives the behaviours and it drives, at a national level, inconsistency of approach. I would also say that we should be considering and comparing um, the services that are being provided um, through local authorities who are, con who are running the contracts and those who are not. In particular, the elevator programme. We're looking at new models now, and I'm not certain whether that knowledge and that expertise and learning from what's happening in Ireland, in particular, um, can, can we can we take that knowledge and reshape business gateway at a local level, but still have that national focus, so that we don't have the national lottery that I just happen to be in money, and I don't get the same service that I'm getting in DNG. Susan Love. Thanks. Um, so there's there's a there's a real challenge around um, how we think about this issue of differences in, in, in local service around the business gateway service in particular. So we want a national consistent advisory service. I think that's been broadly agreed. 
But I know that we and other organisations over the years have also said that there needs to be an element of local flexibility mm -hmm. in how the service is delivered. So we particularly saw this you know, five or six years ago when we were coming out of recession, that the priorities in a local economy might differ from the kind of national priorities that Scottish Government might set for, uh, for the agencies. And we need those delivering the service to be able to respond to support a particular business or a particular sector or a particular geography in a different way. So there will always be some difference if you accept that there needs to be some local flexibility, which we do. Now that said, most people have said that they feel like there's a degree of inconsistency here. My feeling is that, I agree with that, but my feeling is that most of this is um, based on a feeling. It's feedback, it's anecdotal evidence from those that work with Business Gateway. So from our perspective, it would be things like um, our FSB colleagues locally saying, well, I have a great relationship with Business Gateway X, where they're completely engaged and willing to work with us, similar to, to as Liz mentioned, but the gateway next door to it refuses to do any joint events with FSB. So it's that kind of inconsistency. And I think for us, there are, there are elements of what make a good service um, that we have identified. And then the next issue is to what extent are the way that we, that we design the service in terms of designing contracts, targets and monitoring, to what extent does that marry up with what we think makes a good service? And so some of the, the issues that Liz mentioned in terms of your willingness to engage with key partners in the local economy, you know, that, that isn't really something that would be incentivised at the moment. A good service will do that automatically without the need for incentivisation. But without that, you, you, you're not guaranteed of that. But the ultimate problem here in terms of, of comparing what, what's happening across the country is, certainly as far as I can tell, there isn't any data published um, about what's happening in individual gateways. Now, in the past, uh, when the stakeholder group was set up, we used to receive um, sort of quarterly reports about performance by individual gateways. But even then, we were only given actual performance. We weren't given performance against targets, so it was pretty meaningless. Um, so as far as I can see, other than the, the responses from local authorities to this inquiry, I can't tell what's actually happening at individual local authority level. I don't know whether the performance is good or bad. I don't know whether the targets that have been set are ambitious or not, not ambitious. I can't tell if there's a problem. Um, so from that point of view, it's difficult to reach any kind of um, evaluation on the differentiation in services locally. I mean, I'm sure Gate, we have that, but in the public domain, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, uh. I'll try and keep this uh, very brief. I think where SCDI members recognise that there's a kind of inevitable, I can't say that, inevitable consequence of devolving responsibility to 28 local authorities with different local economic priorities and needs. However, we're saying that there's a value to doing that because you'd be able to tailor your service to those local economic challenges and needs. Going back to the measurement, if we can tailor the economic measurements to the economy in the Dumfries and Galloway area in comparison to the central belt economies, which is very different and very different in terms of the targets that should be set and the ambitions for those areas as well in terms of the infrastructure for economic growth. I think that comes into it too. So the targets need to... So what I'm trying to say is the service needs to be tailored locally but have the consistency across the service approach nationally as well. I think what can inevitably stop that is the funding packages for Business Gateway in local authority areas as well. We've had 10 years of local authority austerity to an extent, so that's going to have an impact not just on Business Gateway but other business support services in that region or area too. And I think that is a critical focus on that. You can only run a good service if you've got cash going into it that allows you to innovate, allows you to expand and allows you to make uh, new service provision available too. And I think that's a critical element to, to focus in on here. I think there was a, a survey saying that around about mid 80, 80 odd percent of businesses that had gone through the business gateway service were were happy and satisfied with the service that they, they had, which is fantastic and a really high result. I'd say go for 100% if you could. Uh, you know, that, that's me, uh, uh, and, and that's where I'd, I'd be at. But still, it's a fantastic result. 
I think you need to break those figures down, though, and look at what type of businesses it is yeah. that are saying we're getting a fantastic yeah. services. And the critical element to ensure the Scottish economy grows is not just business startups, is those scale up of businesses that have got a real opportunity to export and trade. We have to put some focus to business gateway there to make a more sustainable economy. Okay. Um, other colleagues will be picking up some of the issues mentioned about data and targets, but we were very mindful of, of the comments that you've made about the lack of published data. Um, can I pick up on one of Matt's comments, which is about the money? You know, follow the money, it, I was always taught. Um, and there seem to be quite distinct variations between local authorities. Um, is that a problem, she says? Um, I don't know what, who wants to go first with that one. Susan? We don't know. Okay. Because I, I, I can't see data on, um, I can't see readily available data on how much is spent on the service, mm. how much local authorities are due to spend on it, how much is actually spent on it. Okay. And, and can I start to that, and also um, whether it's being ring fenced for this mm. service. Um, and I know that we certainly advocated a while back that I believe it should be, um, but that 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 for whatever reason that decision was taken not to ring fence. But I think there's, it's also wider than that in terms of what Susan just said there as well. And your question about funding and what the future model could look like, because I'm mm -hmm. assuming this committee is going to make some, some key recommendations. And I don't think that we should do it in isolation, because if we are looking at, you know, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, they're going through massive change as we speak. And I think we, should, we need to understand what that change is, whether it's process change, whether it's culture change, it's a bit of both, my understanding is, um, and also I think re revisiting what is what could the role of the business gateway organisations be, um, and therefore if we're going to focus, we don't, we're focusing start up there, but business gateway also focus on growth companies. So does Scottish Enterprise. So does Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So will the new South of Scotland Alliance Board. Therefore, that's duplication for, for, for business because, well, if I'm a growing company, do I go into the business gateway? And I, I don't like the word signposting, but do I go into the business gateway? Will they then forward and direct me on to whether it's Scottish Enterprise or... or, or you know, where will that go? And I think that there needs to be a, 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 discussion, a discussion to take place in terms of who is ideally going to be focused on that local delivery element, whether it's start-ups or growth, because we're seeing changes in movements Therefore, and, and, and in particular, Business Gateway was not part of um, the Enterprise and Skills Review, which it may have been a, a, a potential missed opportunity. But can I just reassure the committee, we certainly did discuss Business Gateway in some depth mm -hmm. and in some detail, because we all believe that it should be. We cannot, we cannot carry out a review and make recommend, recommendations for change without recognising the role of the business gateway structure and organisation. So therefore, if it's a pot of money, not looking at what we've got now, it's what are we doing with the rest of the budget? And and, and should that be reproportioned? I, I don't know, because like Susan, I have no idea how much has been spent on business gateway in these areas. Okay, Susan so, Sorry, can I, can I just yep. come, come, come back in? Um, I think it's really important at the outset that although we are talking about support delivered locally, and we're specifically talking about Gateway. Liz is absolutely right. You, we cannot look at the business support landscape by just looking at Gateway. We absolutely cannot, because the sort of core view coming from everybody representing business, and I think three, three of us here sat in the Enterprise and Skills Review group, was that it has to be more focused on, on the user's experience. And the users don't care about whether it's Scottish Enterprise or Business Gateway or Skills Development Scotland, that, that doesn't matter. I mean, ultimately, we need a vision where, in time, most of our support would be delivered. Online, there would still be some one-to-one -one support, but in time, most of it would be delivered one-to-one, -one, and it wouldn't matter which agency or organisation was doing it. But I think, if I just pick up on one point that Liz made about this, this growth business issue, and Matt had spoken about it as well, I mean, I think, if you look at statistics around startups in Scotland, our business birth rate is not great. It's, it's despite all of this, it's not where it should be. Um, Scotland's going to be more reliant on more jobs coming from startup businesses than existing businesses compared to, to elsewhere in, in the UK. So we can't take our eye off the ball in terms of startups mm. um, because that's where our high growth businesses will 
will come from. And I think we get a bit, I know that there has been an increase in the number of businesses over the last 10, 15 years, and we can get a bit complacent about that. But I think there's real serious questions to ask around what do we want in terms of a start-up business rate and who is going to support it? Because Gateway's number of start-ups assisted has remained pretty much the same over this period, despite a big increase in the number of businesses. Now, that might not that could just be because they've had the same amount of resource and so they couldn't possibly have helped any more businesses. But for me, there's a question about, well, if the number of businesses has increased substantially and the resources for gateway for startups haven't, to me, there seems to be a mismatch there in what we want. And I think the reason why Gateway has focused on growth businesses, because you're right that there has been a focus on the need for more scale-ups because of the disproportionate uh, impact some businesses have. I think part of the reason Business Gateway has done that over the years is because for quite a long time it was our impression that Scottish enterprise was not much interested in most local businesses and their aspiration to grow and so Gateway filled that space by being interested in local economies and local businesses they appreciated how important some businesses were to a local economy and were able to nurture them through to the pipeline. So I think there's a reason why Gateway got into that space around helping existing businesses to grow. But longer term, we probably do need to think about the journey and how we are ultimately going to deliver joined up support to businesses. Matt? I'll, I'll keep this very, very brief because uh, I know it's a supplementary question. I think that there is a complex landscape. I said it in my initial remarks of where people can get support and services for different aspects of their business and where they want to improve or or, or, or sustain and maintain their business. That, that's simple. That but The clue's in a title. So it says business gateway. So if you walk into a business gateway, surely we should be able to have a single point gateway that can triage you to the support, whether it's from SC, the agencies, SDS, elsewhere. And if we're going to improve, continuously improve the service moving forward, because I think that's what it's about, is maybe that's the key aspect. They can act as a gateway as such. And whether they offer that for support themselves or whether they pass it to SDS or whether they pass it to SC doesn't matter. It just matters that the business and the user, as Susan has rightly said, gets that support. Maybe that's the improvement. See, Lynn's nodding her head there. Um, just, just echoing this, it's really important that the, it's the, the absolute focus needs to be on the user. They don't care where the support comes from. It's the right person for the right job to give the user the user the right support. Um, just also like to comment on, you know, startups. If we want more scale ups, we need more startups. You know, it's 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 quite it's quite a, a simple approach to to understand where we do need more support is in terms of the missing middle. So what happens when companies start up? They maybe get support for a couple of years' time. If during that period of time they haven't accelerated to the extent to go on to high growth support, they end up going into this missing middle and they get nothing. They're really lost, they feel quite abandoned. And uh, there's considerable gains that can be made to be focusing in on really nurturing that because when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting up a business, the really difficult time comes about two, two to three to four years. The initial excitement of starting the business, you know, is, has uh, you know waned. You're deep into you know tough times, and that's actually when they need you know uh, additional specific support and particularly leadership support um, as well. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, convener. I just want to explore a little bit the the need. Um, for more consistency across uh, the country in, in, in this. I mean, you've all mentioned that the local focus is important, and I think it's always been there from the very beginning. Um, but um, the responsibility for quality assurance and marketing performance was transferred from Scottish Enterprise to COSLA in 2009. Um, and I note from the um, information we've got that the Business Gateway National Unit, although it's responsible for performance monitoring, and targets, etc. None of this reporting is in the public domain. None of the regional performance is in the public domain. What do you think are the key elements of securing more consistency so that there's a minimum level of expectation as to what Business Gateway could deliver regardless of where you are in Scotland? Silence. <laughs> 
For, well, for example, do, do you think this, the information on performance should be in the public domain? Susan Love. Um, yeah, so I mean, we've commented quite extensively that despite quite a lot of criticism over the years, um, from our point of view of a national service, there just isn't the amount of transparency around this service that we would want to see. Um, so there isn't information routinely published about performance by individual areas against contract. There isn't information on why and how um, targets in certain areas are constructed the way that they are. Um, it might be absolutely fine. I just we just don't know because we don't see that that information. And I do understand that the local authorities are concerned about unfair comparisons or uninformed comparisons, but I still feel that it would be better overall to publish more data. Um, I think in terms of securing more consistency, so in some sense the, the data that's gathered, albeit not all published, is intended to provide that information about consistency in terms of the number and type of events, um, the qualifications of the advisors, um, the the number of assists. There's, so the contracts are supposed to be structured at the moment to deliver performance indicators to ensure a consistent level of service. I suppose for me, there's there's a couple of questions: are those the right? Are those delivering the right things that we want delivered consistently across the country? And it feels like some of the evidence is more around this quality of the service angle. So the numbers game, where we are probably collecting data on, albeit not publishing, but the quality aspect, less so. And that might be things like how experienced are the advisors? So not just do they have a qualification, but how experienced are they over and above having their qualification? How much do we engage with the local business community, other stakeholders, other agencies? Can we can we evidence that joint working and where we've attempted to, to do more? Can we evidence innovation in how we deliver business support locally? So I don't know, but it seems to me we're not asking, to, in fairness, we haven't asked for it. So that kind of information would help us. Um, if we gathered that and published it, we would have a better sense of whether that was consistent. But the other um, uh, issue around how do we get the right data and information to ensure consistency is this issue that Liz picked up on. And that's whether the current requirements around gathering data and reporting on it are driving behaviour that mitigates against quality. Um, so we all know that this, the need to have lots of criteria in the contract, targets and performance, we all know that that drives getting numbers through the door. And I think the, all the evidence from businesses through the Enterprise and Skills Review was about the need for more tailored um, support, more time with businesses to talk through what they want to do. Similarly, I would suspect a lot of the business advisors themselves will say, this isn't necessarily the type of support that I want to be giving to a business, but we have to get the numbers up this quarter. So um, for me, it's about what are we asking the right things in terms of the contract and what we're asking for data on and measuring on? Um, it definitely needs more transparency in terms of what's published, and we might need to think about um, how we construct the contracts and what incentivises delivery of them. Um, yeah, I, I, I echo what a lot of Susan said. That, um, targets can drive a perverse behaviour in terms of we've got to achieve this target, get so many people through the door who don't get the support and offering that that they deserve. And, and I'm not saying that happens, but it, it can happen when you set stringent targets across a number of businesses. I think, sorry, a number of business gateways. There has to be transparency. I, I do think that, we, that the data should be reported as part of a continuous improvement exercise. It's as simple as that. You know, you've got to look at the data to look at where we can improve the service moving forward. That's what any business would do. That's what anyone, you know, <laughs> in a sense, how, how do you know to move forward if you don't know what the data is actually telling you? So I think that that's just logical. Um, there is a suggestion by our SNE members that, that they are frustrated by overly bureaucratic processes and inflexible products that sometimes Business Gateway can offer. Uh, and if we don't have the data, we can't readily see that going forward. The, there is an opinion that it's it's rather than inform, there's a about the product they need, there's, a, there's an option to try and sell the product that they don't necessarily want. Mm -hmm. And is that driven by a target mode approach? I, I'm not too sure, but that's some of the feedback that we've had back. Um, and where we need Business Gateway to go is, is catching on to Susan's point again, is to offer that tailored support 
and speed of access, which is critical for businesses to succeed. Now, we start to measure targets in that respect. We can offer a continuous improvement of the service, which I don't think is there at this present moment in time, because we can't see the data and where we need to improve going forward. What needs to be said about the data has already been said. I'd like to bring up one other specific issue about uh, terminologies that are used. So, for example, Business Gateway might track um, women-owned businesses, so businesses that have been started up by female, female entrepreneurs. Other people might track women-led businesses. Scottish Enterprise in its uh, account-managed companies talks about statistics related to companies where the primary contact is a woman. I don't know what that is. The primary contact in the business could be the chief executive, or it could be a personal assistant, or it could be head of marketing. So we need consistency of definitions of what is being tracked and measured across, across the enterprise support system. Uh, one, one or two other um, issues, and that is in terms of the the one place to hold the data. You know, if, if we if we acknowledge that there needs to be a revision in terms of the data and what we're measuring, um, and um, I know that there is work going on as we're speaking right now um, with revisiting that from all of the public sector agencies, and I also understand that there is discussions going on between the agencies and the business. In, I think I'm not sure it's cause or business gateway in terms of creating the one the one place in terms of technology use, utilization technology where businesses can actually just whether it go into business gateway or whether it's any other agency it's that one place and that's the sharing of that data um, so that we're quite clear in terms of a business going into business gateway doesn't have to complete you know five other documents and then get to Scottish Enterprise et al and, and create another five documents about their business so I know that there's work going on in terms of trying to bring that together but it's very early days so you know uh, I think I'm just I'm just sharing that with you and I also under, understand that Business Gate we do have data and it's um, regional data but like Susan and others on this table I've not actually I've not A seen it and B did I go did, did I go to seek it and the answer is no to both those questions some of it's online but you know that's not good enough for the business community and for others that we're using public money on, we need to be quite clear what we're spending that, that, that fund on in terms of where it's going and what impact we're making in terms of our economy. OK, thanks very much. In, in, in your evidence, uh, Liz Cameron, you, you were actually <laughs> appear to be quite critical of the extent to which um, uh, there was an incoherent um, approach to how different business support services are accessed and the, 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 the perception that um, Business Gateway is the, the only place to go for some support. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, and particularly in relationship to the support that's currently provided by the private sector? Yeah, what we're, we, we, we conduct quite a detailed research in terms of preparation for this with Chambers and the, then with their membership. Um, and, you know, I quoted earlier at the beginning about 25,000 workshops taking place. Um, and, you know, my, my question is, is that the best use of public sector support services? Um, because a lot of these workshops are actually available through the private sector. So there's a, a level, in our opinion, of potential duplication of service. And therefore, that takes us into the partnership element that, yes, businesses, especially startup businesses, and those moving into the next level of their, their growth, but at times it may be that Business Gateway and others should actually pull back from providing some of that service uh, and or work in partnership with local private sector players because it's, it's available, the services are there, so why are we delivering it through Business Gateway? And is, is, there, good, um, is there good examples of that happening in some parts of the country? There's, of um, positive partnerships, mm -hmm. yes. meaning, yes, um, for instance, in um, Aberdeen, they do a lot of the work through the elevator and in uh, Tayside and also in Lanarkshire, um, where you've actually got, we, we, we talked about people making things happen. You've actually got some chambers of commerce co-locating with their local business gateway. And that's actually creating very, very strong partnerships that we can actually lever the public sector support and also the private sector. And that's where I think that that could be a model 
for the development of of the service moving forward. Um, and a, a few other examples, because it is about local delivery, and a few other examples where you've now got some pilots on local export partnerships, where you have local authorities, you have SDI, you have chambers, you have a lot of the organisations in the, around this table today, all working together on local economic development plans that's particularly focusing on the business need for the area and also the expertise that's in that area and utilising and levering private sector support in. And I think that's, you know, it's there to be levered. We should perhaps stop and take stock of what is the role of public sector business support services because there is a role. There absolutely is a role there, but let's look at how we can actually work and complement between public and private sector working together. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to follow up on this point about access in a gateway. Um, and so Matt mentioned earlier the role of Business Gateway being a gateway. Um, and I suppose we um, felt like this, this, this is an aspect of what might have been envisaged for Business Gateway over the last 10 years that really hasn't, um, hasn't been borne out in practice. And most of that's not Business Gateway's fault, but there hasn't been uh, really a commitment to using Business Gateway as, as the access point for businesses seeking support. And from our perspective, there's kind of two or three main reasons for this. The first is that what businesses seek support on um, has, has really mushroomed. What we want of businesses, what we demand of businesses has really grown in the last 10 years. So we place all kinds of expectations on small firms now that we want in terms of becoming more innovative, more productive, exporting more, um, being more resource efficient and operating sustainably, um, looking after the well-being of their, their workforce, becoming more digital and cyber secure. There's a whole range of things that we want businesses to do over and above just starting and growing a business. Now, there is a lot more support that's growing to service these needs of smaller businesses, but unfortunately that has meant even more support to be corralled into our business support landscape service. And we haven't necessarily always thought about how those other services would interact and work with Business Gateway. So we're expecting Gateway to just be able to be the gateway and the signposting to these services without always thinking through whether we've got the right processes to enable that and given the resources to Gateway to do that. But the second issue is over and above Gateway, I just haven't seen a commitment from other parts of the public sector to support Business Gateway as a gateway. I just haven't seen it at all. I think most agencies have been primarily preoccupied with their own brands and programmes and selling themselves rather than thinking first about whether it would be better to deliver this service in collaboration with Business Gateway and that should be the best route for businesses to access our service. And the Scottish Government also has, has not helped this by funding a lot of additional programmes and activity and websites and communications when it should have been standing up for Business Gateway first of all and saying, first of all, can we deliver this service through Business Gateway? That should be the primary route before we think about developing other websites or marketing campaigns for initiatives. Okay, thank you. <coughs> John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, I think I'm kind of continuing some of the stuff that Jackie Bailey and uh, Andy Whiteman have been asking. So, but I suppose listening to the answers, I'm, I end up being a bit confused uh, in this, around this area of targets and performance, because uh, on the one hand, uh, I think Liz Cameron said and talked about playing with numbers. And if I got you correctly, that if we just focus on the numbers, we're inevitably going to get inconsistency. And yet, if we don't have the numbers. You know, I just don't see how we measure all this. And, I mean, yesterday some of us were out in Lanarkshire and that was very interesting. And I think they've got a contract with the two councils and that's got some quite specific figures. Uh, I think they've got to do something like 1,100 startups plus 500 growth companies. And out of their startups, they get 20% that become growth companies. So that all seemed kind of clear. And they had a bit of leeway from what I understood, but they also had specific targets. On the other hand, I mean, Glasgow's in next and I'll be... Uh, speaking to them, but they, they if I understand in their submission, they've got a column called Volume Starts, which went from 1,001 in 2010 to 407 in 2017. And, and they seem to be saying that that's not a good way of measuring. And in fact, they say there are arguments for both having an in-house service aligned with local economic needs, 
but also subcontracted out where providers are targeted and will achieve greater numbers, which strikes me as quite a bizarre thing to say, that if it wasn't them doing it, there'd be greater numbers elsewhere, but these numbers wouldn't matter. Can you, any of you give me any clarity in this, where we're going? Susan, um, love. So I, su I suppose a, th a theme in what we're saying around all of the data and the statistics available is um, th it's not clear for people what this, the data that we currently gather is telling us and how that informs the decisions we make about what we ask gateway services to do and how much money we give them to do it. I just, I just don't see this clear rationale for um, what is it we want to achieve? What are the, what's the statistics telling us and where would we target our resources? So, so shouldn't we, should we not be asking for data or should we be asking for different so, data? So a question, I, so a question that I uh, have, and I, and I don't know the answer to this, is specifically if you look at the, the Glasgow example. So in the Economic Indicators Report, which uh, Slade publishes every year, which gives a sort of very broad overview of economic development in councils across the country, one of the indicators used is the Business Gateway Startups figure. Now, when you read through the most recent one, you'll see, when you look at the graph of the different local authorities, and they give three years for this, it, it jumps out at you that the Glasgow figure looks to have almost halved over the space of three years. But, but we know that the number of businesses in Glasgow has increased dramatically in recent years more than anywhere else. So, so for me, the question arising from that day is, what, what, what's this telling us? I don't know the story behind that. Has the council made a conscious decision to put less resource into startups because they think that there's many more startups happening anyway in Glasgow and therefore the resource might be better spent in other areas of the business gateway service or elsewhere? Or are they not doing a good job? Is there a reason why the, the number of startups has, has dramatically reduced? So we're, I guess what I'm saying is we're producing data, but I don't understand what it's telling mm. us and what it might mean around where Glasgow goes next. So my question is, well, what's Glasgow doing this year? Right, well, I'll, well, I'll pass on your question with my question to Glasgow <laughs> uh, in, in the next session. But I mean, I, I suppose that I end up being more confused now because I mean, that w could actually argue that, that we need more inconsistency because the situation in Glasgow is so different from somewhere else that we're just going to do completely different things. And yet, if we are trying to do something nationally, as this committee is and some of your organisations are, we're actually trying to get consistency, we're trying to get the same figures. Can I bring in Matt Lancashire at this point? Maybe? Yeah, I, I think this, this, the, the earlier statement you made around keeping it in-house or going externals seems a bit like quantity and quality kind of approach. And, and actually, it's both that we desire. <laughs> so we want a quality service that delivers to a lot of businesses. So if there's elements of the... Pro and, and this goes back to why the statistics and data needs to be published. So if there's a reason why private providers are driving increased numbers through the door than in comparison to local providers. There's a reason for that. And we need to know what that is through the data and through conversations with them to understand that. At the same time, if there is a thought, which has come out in some of the evidence that we've all said today, that there is sometimes, uh, not always private providers, but also uh, uh, local authority providers of Business Gateway too, a poor service or a poorer type of service happening or a lack of quality, we need to understand that too. And at the same time, if there are best practice things happen in business gateways and external providers, so we need to understand that. So I, I think this is a quality, quantity discussion. And actually, and are, are you saying we can live with both, that we're, we're looking for both quantity and quality? I, I, well, we, we want businesses accessing business gateway, absolutely no doubt. The service they offer is, is positive, we've all said that, and we want a high level number of businesses doing so, but we want to ensure the quality of what's being offered increases and continuously improves and moves with the time towards that digital approach. So not necessarily that we can live with the both, but finding the best in what each each are doing and bringing those together to redevelop the service. Because is the service. tendency not when we as government or whatever try and improve things, it is based on the numbers, it is based on the, the quantity, and that we do that in the health service and we do that elsewhere. It's, yeah. it's harder to measure the quality. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, and that's why I think Going back to Liz's earlier point, there needs to be a measure, and, and Susan, and my own point was there needs to be a measurement around that quality of support. So how do you fix a KPI that says 
this is a quality support service, which is difficult to do, but not unachievable. And there's certain other, certainly in other government contracts, it just it doesn't focus on the numbers, it focuses on that quality support. If you look at employment and employability and skills contracts in particular, they don't just focus on the number of people going through the door, they also focus on the quality of service that individual's get, getting. We can apply the same principle to a business gateway as well. Okay. Um, I mean, yesterday when we went into Lanarkshire, one of the interesting comments that was made was that um, as they got more women advisors in their team, they were getting more women coming to them uh, seeking advice. Uh, and the, su the suggestion seemed to be that, you know, some women found it easier to discuss their business with other women. I mean, in this area of targets to, should we be setting specific targets, do you think? And, and should performance be measured around how many uh, businesses are led by women, how many startups by women, how many growth by women? Uh, would you be arguing for that side of things? Uh, uh, absolutely, because you can see from the information that's available already, um, you've got a 50-50 balance of um, females, males, businesses coming into Business Gateway. That drops down to about 22% of businesses as they move through the growth pipeline. And then actually when you go on to Scottish Enterprise Account Managed Services, the number of businesses that are led by females is 3.4%. So we, the, the, the data, we, you know, we need more information around this data to be able to continually prove this and see where the, the, the issues are in terms of people dropping off. Um, you've got some really great examples of female female-focused uh, support programmes, for example, the initiative that is run by Edinburgh Business Gateway is absolutely tremendous. You can see that coming through in terms of the results of female-led businesses that they are, are setting up in Edinburgh is, is better than many other areas. The female-specific support is very, very important for females at the start of the journey. There's also information, there's research that shows um, a person, uh, if they get bad advice when they come along to an advisor, not necessarily just a business gateway, but if on their first visit they get bad advice, it can actually put the person off starting a business for up to 10 years, which is really quite incredible. So this is why the quality of the first inter the very first intervention of anyone starting up a business is really important. And females approach their businesses, setting up their businesses quite differently. They need gender-specific support to help them on that process. So, I mean, that might suggest that, that you feel somebody nationally, maybe us or the government, should be telling Business Gateway, you know, much more specifically, you must do this, that and the next, to try and get better consistency, to try and make sure there's enough women coming through the system and, and all that kind of thing. Is, is that the kind of argument you would put? Yes, please. <laughs> um, I, I would advocate for a national head, uh, a national head of women in business for Business Gateway. I think that's really important to have, you know, somebody leading that, setting that policy throughout, and then feeding that out reg regionally. Okay, I think Ms. Cameron wanted to come in. Yeah, I just think following your 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 female discussion there. Um, there's actually, um, you're right in terms of, we, we operate a mentoring programme and I've been doing so for a number of years. Um, now, currently, 42% of the businesses that are being mentored are female. Um, and we do, or we do give them the option, do they wish a female mentor or a male mentor? I've got to see some prefer females for a variety of reasons. Some do not. So I think that, you know, just be cautious in terms of what we're trying to slot people into. Um, so, I mean, that's available. We've also got a specific women's mentoring programme. And over the last, um, what, 12 months, we've put 250 women through that as well, as have other organisations, because we've also got the, 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 the government's Women's Action Plan group. And, we, and there's over 17, 17 organisations representing women from funding, investment, support on that group. And we're all currently looking at, should we actually look at, uh, you know, um, uh, Professor Sarah Carter was looking at, should we operate and, 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 and look at a, a national advisory unit um, looking at gender-specific business support. So there's work already just starting, and perhaps that is a recommendation that you want to look at in terms of what we're doing in that in that space. And in terms of, there's also other research been in, done in terms of gender-specific um, business leaders and business owners. Um, and, and um, uh, 
Lynn's absolutely right in terms of that growth pipeline, but it's also quite clear that people say, well, women don't have X, Y, and Z, and, are, and I've also heard it said that there were, were, we are not risk-averse either. Uh, it's not that we're not risk-averse, we're debt-averse in some cases. Therefore, a lot of female, females who do start up business, they're actually under-resourced from day one. That is an issue that should be looked at in terms of that business support advisory service. So there's wider implications than just, you know, um, focusing just on the gender. I'm conscious of time. Um, it's obviously limited here, but also that this is a point that I think could be developed further. And I wonder if um, our witnesses might think about writing in on that specific point to the committee just to, to follow up on any points that we don't have the, the time to deal with here, because I think the committee would be interested in hearing further on, on these issues. Um, there's a couple of brief follow-ups which may be indeed on these points, first of all from Dean Lockhart and then Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, convener, and thanks to the panel for coming in today. I've got a couple of questions, so I'll ask them at the same time, and the panel can respond as, as they see fit. The first is on funding. Uh, according to latest figures, the total amount invested by Business Gateway last year was £12.6 million across Scotland uh, for all start-up investments. Given that the entire enterprise budget is around £500 million, does the panel think that's the right balance between investing in start-ups uh, compared to elsewhere? And my second question is, following up on the topic of digital support and the importance of helping startups and other companies develop an e-commerce platform, given the complexities and the specialist skills required in that area, is it realistic to expect Business Gateway to provide those services or should we be looking for another body to provide specialist services in e-commerce? I'll try and keep it brief. Um, first of all, um, is that the right money to spend on startups? Um, I don't know without a more detailed evaluation around um, what it is we want Gateway to do. So there needs to be a decision about whether we are happy with the current number of startup assists that we ask Gateway to do, or whether we think that that should be more because there are more businesses and we need more startups or less because there are more players in that market and online advice. I genuinely don't know, and we would need to evaluate that and look at the money we spend on business support in the round. Um, second question about digital startups. So one of the points we've made over the last few years is that we're investing a lot of money in digital infrastructure, but all of the evidence um, available would suggest that we don't have the digital skills and businesses um, to capitalise upon that infrastructure investment. So most businesses will say digital skills are really important to their business, but only two-fifths feel like they have staff with the skills available to deliver that. So we know the digital boost programme has been delivered through Business Gateway, um, which seems to be uh, seems to evaluate fairly well as, as far as I'm aware. I suppose I would just comment that we've been quite slow, I think, to think about um, the opportunities by different business sectors. So e-commerce, um, the UK is the biggest e-commerce user in the world as far as I'm aware, and yet we haven't really identified that as an area of business growth um, to support recognising the specific skills um, that that sector needs. Um, Lynn Caden. Um, just um, again agree with Susan, we can't really specifically say if 12.6 million is appropriate out of 500 million without knowing, knowing more information. Very quickly on the digital support, um, tailored digi digital support for people is really important, um, particularly obviously for, for rural areas, need to think about all the different activities that are involved in that. But it's also important for everyone to realise that being an entrepreneur is incredibly, incredibly challenging and rewarding, but it can also be a very lonely journey at particular points in time. So that peer-to-peer -peer support and that face-to-face -face interaction from networks of people in your local and further areas is really important. So it can't be you know, one thing or the other, it needs to be a blend of uh, both supports. Um, Liz Cameron. I'll be, I'll be brief. I agree with all of um, all the comments in the first question, but I would actually emphasise that we're talking about business gateway, we're talking about startups. My understanding of business gateways va varying across the country. They do startups, they do mentoring, they do training workshops, they deal with growth companies, and they're now venturing into international support. So, 
you know, we're, we're, and that's where this misconception is coming in about it was started. It was started started up for business startups. It has grown and developed into those areas. Whether that's the right decision or not, I think that's for others to, to review, and that would then depend on. So, how much is that worth, and what's the impact it's had? Um, your second question on um, digital support. Uh, actually, um, I, I think that, that we need to um, revisit dramatically the whole digital strategy for Scotland because it's not good enough and it's not fully understood. Um, we all talk about digital skills. Half of us don't even know what we're talking about when we say that um, because it's at different levels. Um, and also the skill base and e-commerce. And in fact, Scotland is actually way behind in the use of e-commerce in terms of trading internationally. And given our geography and given our international connectivity, e-commerce should in fact be um, focused on a lot more than what we're doing right now. Um, and we talk about training. Um, we also need further investment in the infrastructure. There are some parts of Scotland that we can send them on digital boost courses to whenever. If they do not have the infrastructure, we're wasting more time. Right. Gordon MacDonald. Just a follow-up. It's just a follow-up follow to John Mason's questions to Susan Love. Um, you said that Glasgow may have been using funding elsewhere. You couldn't tell why there had been a reduction in the graph. And earlier on, you, you mentioned the fact that Scottish Government was um, supporting business with funding streams elsewhere. I'm just wondering if you've got a view on whether there should be a reintroduction of ring fencing in councils, bearing in mind the majority of business gateways have been taken in-house. Absolutely. It's a national service. If there's a certain amount of money that's um, given to local authorities to deliver the service, sure, we think it should be ring-fenced. But I don't know if it's not all being... It may well all be yeah. being spent on Gateway. I just don't know. Right. OK. I think so. there's, a, there's another question in that, mm -hmm. and that is how much of the additional economic development services, mm -hmm. um, how much of that, if any, is actually contributing to the business Gateway services? I think it goes flows... It flows from think, from yeah. one budget to the other, and I don't know the answer I think to that it, question I, either. I mean, just one thing that we've not really um, sort of gone into today, and we're happy to follow up more on it, is I do think it's worth bearing in mind um, all of the additional work that economic development departments do to support businesses mm -hmm. over and above business gateway. Um, so we know that, I think, again, from the Slade indicators, about 15,000 businesses are helped over and above Business Gateway by council economic development departments, and that could be through um, property, it could be through employability advice, it could be through procurement support, provision um, of, of premises and other finance advice. There's a whole range of other things that councils are delivering. I suppose the question for us is around... So if you look, look not just at the funding going into Gateway, but the wider economic development yeah. departments and consider the real squeeze on those departments where we know that in some areas, you know, we might have a really tiny economic development department having to do all of that and deliver the business Gateway contract. And I think that's an element that should be explored when we're thinking about these issues of inconsistency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. I think I can take from what the panel's been saying that there are concerns about uh, the measurements that are being put out there. What, do, what, do, what about the monitoring and evaluation? Who's actually doing that? There's, ver there's various uh, um, ways that the service is delivered across Scotland. It's not consistent. How is that monitored and evaluated? Who does that? Uh are you asking? You're asking us what our view is in terms a of question, a general question. As to okay. Who monitors it? Okay. And uh, obviously, the, the follow-up will be: is it adequate? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a different last start, a different maybe different levels of um, local monitoring and evaluation. Um, a, I'm assuming that that's done. If I'm a local authority, I'm assuming that if I've got a department out there contracted to do X, Y, and Z, that if I'm head of economic development, I'll want to know what its economic impact is making to my area. Now, I don't know whether that's done, that would, in an ideal world, that's what should be done. But I actually think there should be, on top, uh, over, over, overseeing all of this at a national level, we should have national evaluation being done across all of the, all of the support services here. Because we, we did, we used to have a, a, a group yeah. of partners, but, but then when it actually, uh, as it evolved, that group 
became no longer. Um, there needs to be a level of monitoring and evaluation done, but an independent level of monitoring and evaluation. Now, if that's coming from Scottish Government, then it should be Scottish Government, and indeed I would recommend that the customers are actually part of that evaluation and that monitoring. Just leading on from what you're saying there, that brings into question the governance of uh, Business Gateway. Is it appropriate, the present governance? Should it be done through COSLA? You're saying the Scottish Government should be more involved. Does that mean that uh, you're saying that uh, it's what's happening now is inadequate? I think it's less transparent than what it could be. Um, and on that basis, if you've got, um, at the end of the day, COSLA is a representative body of the local authorities. Um, and they've obviously got a, 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 a monitoring and a, a reporting relationship there. But is that truly independent and is it as transparent as what it could be? And perhaps not. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. Um, and, and it's a good question too. Obviously, COS will play a role in monitoring that service. And, and that's, I think that's a positive because it enables us to get decent feedback in terms of, again, how the service is progressing and where it could progress further. I think a in, more interesting point, though, is, is how we envelope what's come out of the Enterprise and Skills Review around alignment and interagency collaboration and how we weave that into Business Gateway and then monitor the success of the service going forward and whether it's COSLA and others together monitor that service going forward I'm unsure of because if essentially if you're going to improve business gateway the SR review said you know that we need an interagency collaboration we need X well I mean said to happen um, and at the moment if it's just causal monitoring business gateway moving forward how are you going to get that interagency inter collaboration I'm not entirely too sure so maybe there's a role for other agencies to support that activity too, to ensure that we have alignment across the service provisions of our agencies and Business Gateway and COSL and local authorities to ensure that tailored support or the right support for businesses going forward. Probably not answered the question, but I think in the future, I'm trying to say there needs to be probably perhaps other agencies involved in that monitoring service. Is what you're saying that Business Gateway has become somewhat isolated? Yeah. by being backed into the council? It, it, it's isolated in terms of its ability to align and engage with other service provision that's available in Scotland. And in a way, if we could achieve that, we will create greater value for the businesses that go through it. And with that comes greater productivity and greater economic growth. Yeah, so, um, so on evaluation, so the, there obviously is monitoring data that's collected by uh, COSLA, um, which is, I, I don't have any issues with that. It seems to be fairly consistent in terms of the data that's gathered by the company contracted to do it. Um, th there's a fair degree of consistency in terms of the satisfaction and delivery rates that that, that suggests. As we've mentioned earlier, there isn't, however, a lot of external publishing against targets. Um, the more troubling thing for me around governance is the um, involvement and input of stakeholders and partners to the development of contracts. So um, we've been involved in the past, but more la laterally, I don't know who, who's involved from an external point of view in terms of what should the targets and focus for the gateway contract in this area be. No idea. We're, we've certainly not been asked to contribute to it. Um, and so that concerns me around um, the opportunity for others to, to have some input to the design of the service and the targets and the priorities and how it's evaluated and who, you, who you're accountable to. In terms of governance specifically, um, so we've made quite a lot of comment around involvement of stakeholders and users of this national service, which we just don't think is remotely good enough at the moment. Um, but one of the ultimate questions that's come up consistently around delivery of business gateway service is, so this is a national service that Scottish Government funds. If we do believe that there's an issue with consistency, if we do believe that we're not getting the service in an area that we think we should be getting, who do I go to about that? <coughs> what, if I, who do I speak to in COSLA? What are they going to do? What's the Scottish Government going to do? Is the local authority going to do something? The sanctions for failure to meet contract are completely unclear to me. And for me, that's, that's an issue around the sort of accountability structure that we've got around Gateway at the moment. Um, and lastly, the point that Matt made is, is, is absolutely fundamental here in terms of 
the really critical services that local government delivers around um, business growth and support getting integrated into this broader view of, of, of how we want to improve support um, for the economy. Now, because of the sensitivities around bringing local government into this, that has made it difficult for local government to always be considered alongside the agencies. And as Liz mentioned at the start, that's been a stumbling block throughout the Enterprise and Skills Review and still, to a certain extent, is, is a stumbling block. From our perspective, if you can't find a way to overcome the issues of local governance being brought into this national approach in terms of, for example, the work the analytical unit is doing that's been set up by Strategic Board, we are never going to have the seamless service that we want for businesses. So we have to find a way to get both local and national leaders to share this commitment to work together to provide a service for business. Maidenhead, I think you've been wanting to come in. Uh, for, for just a um, very quickly, I'm in, interested in a, in a qualitative assessment of the, the advisors and the advice that they give, because again, we see discrepancies. You know, one person will get one set of advice, one will, one will get another. Uh, so coming back to setting of, you know, standards uh, that advisors need to uh, adhere to, annual reviews, all advisors to be trained in gender aware uh, business support and obviously the opportunity for the user, the customer, to freely give 360 degree feedback to, to the business advisor because sometimes we we hear stories of uh, users not being not being satisfied with the advice that they've been given but they are reluctant to tell anyone that they're not satisfied with the advice that's been given in case they get no further support. So there needs to be an independent way for, for both sides to give um, you know, free, free and frank feedback. Right, thank you. And we'll now move to um, Angela Constance. I'm very conscious that uh, time is pressing and I had wanted to ask uh, all the panel to consider how um, the approach to mainstream inequalities uh, could be improved uh, as well as making it more sustainable but that's perhaps something uh, that can be followed up uh, in, in correspondence convener but I do want to specifically uh, ask the FSB and uh, Women's Enterprise Scotland uh, a, a few things. Um, Miss Lovin, you're uh, Written evidence, you um, spoke about how more consideration needs to be given to how that the current business support uh, landscape uh, actually reaches those underrepresented groups, whether that's women, whether that's people from a black and minority ethnic community, those from areas of deprivation, uh, I would also add in people uh, with, with, with disabilities. And I wonder if you say a bit more about that as well as your suggestion that there are different products and support services required for women um, and that we shouldn't just be uh, churning out the same old, same old and just uh, uh, targeting um, you know, services that perhaps are uh, gender aware. But I also wondered uh, whether more thought needed to be given also around other uh, underrepresented groups as well. Yeah, okay, so um, so something we highlighted is that whilst I'm sure that there are some um, areas where this is a priority and it's something you think about, you don't, gen you don't generally hear this spoken about in terms of what we ask Business Gateway to do. And back to this point about what are the priorities, I suppose we're just reflecting upon if we want an inclusive growth strategy, that might mean that we need different priorities rather than just any volume startup or any business um, pipeline business. We might want to look at whether um, actually that's not driving the type of inclusive economy we want for this area. What we actually want to do is focus on more businesses in this particular geographic bit of our patch where we know that there isn't enough economic activity, we know there aren't enough businesses being started. Um, Something that we that used to be spoken about about 15 years ago a lot more in terms of more um, action to encourage um, entrepreneurship amongst those in less affluent areas, you, you don't really hear it spoken about that much now, despite the fact that we know that if you've got less assets, you're less likely to start a business. Now, that doesn't seem right to me if we want to encourage more business startups, and that would seem to me to be something that we would want to, to think about. Similarly, I, I think as far as we're aware, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, we think, we think there's only one gateway in the country that's got an advisor specifically looking at um, black and minority ethnic community entrepreneurs. 
and again that that might be um, here maybe I'm wrong so but that might be something that we want to to focus more on as well now we sort of come from a position that in the past that we might want to just mainstream all of this advice and every business advisor should be able and informed enough to deliver this advice to any type of business owner that walks through the door. And I suppose our view has changed in as much as we perhaps need to segment what we do a bit better if we want to target these groups. So as, as Lynn was talking about earlier, um, and Liz mentioned it too, we know that women start businesses um, at a different age, with different experience in different sectors, and they're less capitalised. And so that might mean that our standard startup advice and product will not work as effectively for that group of business owners. Um, so I think we're coming into this period now of starting to think about we need different products and advice if we want to prioritise these different groups who are currently underrepresented amongst our business owners. Okay, uh, before I ask Ms uh, Cadenhead to, to, to add to that, um, I just wanted to uh, confirm some uh, fa factual information uh, that Women's Enterprise Scotland uh, provided. Uh, in your evidence, you said that uh, if women started businesses at the same rate as men, this would boost their economy uh, by £7.6 billion. Pounds. Uh, is that GVA? Um, is that per annum? And is that uh, based on the work of Professor uh, Sarah Carter? Good. Yes. <laughs> um, and I also uh, wonder uh, if Ms um, Cadenhead would say more about why women are less likely than men uh, to get the support for their ideas and perhaps how we overcome the bias against lifestyle uh, businesses. Uh, but specifically, um, how would uh, a, a national policy-driven approach uh, for women-led uh, businesses actually help, you know, and what would that look like? Um, there's no one specific reason for why women start up businesses, um, you know, at a different different rate in men. But you know, fundamentally, it comes down to what we have talked about before: is their approach to risk. Uh, we've heard that women, you know, may be considered debt averse, but they are not risk averse. They actually have advanced risk awareness, and this translates into to prudence uh, in terms of their projections, which can sometimes be seen as uh, by people who are assessing their proposals as lack of ambition. It's not lack of ambition, it's actually prudence. And this prudence is good for the sustainability of the business, but it takes them longer to be able to get there. Uh, females start their business, they're not just undercapitalised, they start their business with one third of the capital that males do. Yet on a like-for-like -like basis, if they had the same amount of capital, they would be, be performing just as well as male-led businesses. Uh, we have to uh, understand that women have multiple roles in society always have done, always will. Um, so they need, um, you know, so, so that translates into diff different levels of time that they can actually dedicate to their businesses as well. So lots of different, you know, lots of reasons uh, to, to consider there. In terms of, you know, how we can take this forward, as, as Liz was indicating, we are advocating very strongly for the establishment of a national women's business centre set up in Scotland with strategic funding over a number of years. Uh, this is uh, based on the successful American and Canadian models, um, which give you know highly tailored support uh, to females that are starting up in their business, which is specific for their needs and time at that particular point in their journey. So again, recognising that females are on a journey. Sometimes they'll want female-specific support, sometimes they won't, but it's a journey and we give them that support at the different points in time. So... Um, advocating for a National Women's Business Centre which seeks to enhance and complement the standard services that are offered by Business Gateway but giving the tailored support uh, for women and again that comes back to us uh, equally advocating for a national head of women in business for Business Gateway to set that national policy and, and work together and again working together with all the other organisations it's about collaboration rather than people seeking to protect their personal fiefdoms. Yeah. OK. And can I just check, the, the Scottish Framework and Action Plan for Women in Enterprise 2017, I would like to know who has signed up to that and whether or not there are any feet draggers. In terms of who has signed up to yeah, it, the, the members who's, who's, around who's the support, table? Who's supporting, who's supporting um, the framework and who's dragging their feet? 
We're trying to. <laughs> no, no. So um, the, cha the Chamber's involved, FSB's involved, um, Scottish Enterprise is involved, uh, Business Gateway's involved. There's a number of different partners around the table. Uh, we, we have the framework meetings that happen um, once a quarter. Uh, we do have an action plan. Uh, we've got specific messages that we're doing, so we, we are getting there. Mm -hmm. But you will usually find that it comes down to a select few that actually drive the actions forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wondered whether there was anybody missing, anybody that you wanted to <laughs> name and shame that should be part of this agenda who are dragging their feet. I don't think there's anyone missing. Well, I, think, I think the issue you're going to find, particularly from a sort of... A you know, business gateway support is, is, is back to this issue around um, you might find differing levels of commitment towards this as a priority. So some areas um, we know have fantastic leaders in economic development who are doing great work to encourage more women to start up businesses. Other areas there might be that might be considered less of a priority or again it might be that there just isn't the capacity in that area to do any additional activity and that might be why they're doing less on it. Okay. And I think coming, coming coming back to the seven point six billion your know, additional economic contribution that you know women would make if they started up businesses at the same rate as men. If you look at that figure, that's actually higher than some of the other sectors that we are pouring so much money into in terms of life sciences technologies, enabling technologies, food and drink. Women as a cross cutting priority sector is really important to the growth of our economy. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we don't, we, we've slightly overrun our time here. We don't want the next panel of witnesses to think of the committee as feet dragging. So thank you very much for coming in and I'll suspend the session for changeover of witnesses.
Well, welcome back to our business support inquiry. And uh, we have a fresh panel of witnesses. And perhaps if I could introduce them from right to left this time, my right to left, that is. First of all, we have Pamela Stevenson, from, uh, who is the business group chair of SLAED. Graham Smith from Glasgow City Council. Dr. Siobhan Jordan, who is the director of Interface. Uh, Pamela Reed, director of Ecosgen, and Jan Falconer, Head of Economic Development, Dumfries and Galloway Council. So if I might start with a question which I think I'd like to direct to the two um, council witnesses, Graham Smith and Jan Falconer, before we move on to questions from other committee members. Um, do you have comments to make on the effectiveness of business support provision to SMEs at a local level since uh, the business gateway was transferred to local authorities. Um, Jan Falconer. Uh, sorry, I should say to our witnesses that the, there's no need to press any buttons. The sound desk will operate systems. And if you want to come into the discussion at any point, please just indicate with your hand to me. Don't feel you need to answer every question. We'll see how matters develop. But first of all, Jan Falconer. Uh, Thank you. I've had the pleasure of being working in three different local authorities where Business Gateway has been introduced. Uh, my career has been since 2006, initially with Aberdeen City Council, then with Orkney Island Council, and currently with Dunfries and Galloway Councils. What I can say, and this is my observation, uh, Business Gateway has grown. Business Gateway just doesn't work by itself. It works in collaboration with others. I think that's the hallmark of it. It has gone through different, uh, different ways of delivery. So in Aberdeen City and Shire, it's delivered by contract by a third party, but uh, intersects really well with the Chamber and also with the uh, other agencies that are there. Similarly in Orkney, where it's co-located with um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, but is a key part of the Council and the Council's operations. In Dumfries and Galloway, it's, uh, it, it's just recently been co-located with the Economic Development Team, which has supports each other, and Business Gateway is seen as a real key part of it. It's co-located now with Scottish Enterprise. What we're trying to do with the small amount of, of government um, public, public sector funding is to be able to eke out the most that you can so the council ensures in Dumfries and Galloway that its whole suite of assets are available for, for the uh, service to be delivered, and not only that, third sector partners helps with that delivery, which is really useful. We also ensure that we can use the talents of our people, that is really important, but we can also bring in talented uh, companies through contract. That is a challenge because we all have to use the public procurement process, but... I your effective or these councils you mentioned are or the business gate we're effective in doing that I, what I, what I'm trying to explain that it is effective but it's been growing and it's been growing through collaboration mm -hmm. right thank you very much and Graham Smith yeah I think since the transfer of the business gateway service it's been highly effective in Glasgow what it's allowed us to do in the city is integrate it more widely within an economic context to provide an overarching service that concentrates on a deeper more meaningful engagement yes we provide the baseline service as we've heard from the the previous panel in terms of the number of workshops and, and the advisory service but by concentrating and integrating it within economic development, that's really allowed us to, to focus our, our service in ensuring that businesses get the support that they need, that it's integrated to the, the, the wraparound service provided by the wider enterprise agencies, as well as our, our local council funding. So in answer to your question, yes, I think it has been an effective no. Th thank you. And perhaps before we then move on to other witnesses, I'll just give Pamela Stevenson an opportunity to respond to my question. Others may come in, touch on it when they answer further questions from committee members. Um, Pamela Stevenson. Thank you. Yeah, Slade, for, for those I'm hopefully everyone will be aware, Slade is the, the professional network body for the 32 local authorities to deliver um, best practice and sustainable economic development. So that includes the delivery of business gateway services across the local authorities and including our 18 lead 
areas. That also includes the 57 local offices that we deliver. So from that perspective, you know, we have seen some fundamental changes and challenges over the years, the last 10 years. But just like Graham said, one of the key opportunities it's had for us and evident for us from local authorities and across Scotland is the allowance to ensure that we can integrate into our wider national services and our wider local authority services. I'm ex-Scottish Enterprise from many years ago. To see it now in both camps of the challenges you had working from one national agency to then working at a local agency, it actually does clearly show that it requires us to have that local element of flexibility, but allows us to have that integration with our planning departments, our rates departments, our environmental departments, and really truly is starting to show some um, encouragement across the piece. Thank you. I'll turn to Jackie Bailey now. Thank you, convener. Um, I want to explore with you what some might call postcode lottery, um, others would call um, a geographical difference. <laughs> Whichever you call it, could you maybe comment on, on the differences that there are between business gateway models, um, both in terms of delivery, but also in terms of finance? I don't know who wants to go first. Hi. So yes, obviously there is 32 local authorities, there's 18 lead um, business gateway and 57 um, local offices. It is down to geographics, we don't like to use that terminology, I don't think it's very encouraging of, of postcode lottery, I think it's definitely down to a national consistent, what was a core element that we were given t 10 years ago, but now it's very much about how do we flex that to suit the local priorities and local needs of our demographics. Um, it is very difficult to look at the difference between city-centric and rural, so we do have to work hard to share best practice and sweat our assets, as they say, to ensure that we can leverage in private sector work and collaborative um, approaches with our national stakeholders at regional levels. That hasn't necessarily always been great in the past, but you no, know, I do feel that we're on a new journey over the last couple of years, particularly with working um, with Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Government on the Enterprise Skills Review to look at how we can improve collaboration, more in consistency, making sure that some of the national projects coming out of Scottish Government are being delivered at a regional level. Okay. Pamela Reid. Um, yeah. Really just to, to reiterate and add to, to, to what Pamela said, um, the rural dimension, um, I work as a research um, consultant, and so I'm not sort of directly involved in, in the delivery of Business Gateway or, or local economic development, but that regional element, particularly when you look at service delivery across all sorts of services in rural and isolated areas, like in the Highlands and Islands, I think is, is something that really needs to, to, to be looked into. And linked to that, we recently evaluated business support to um, social enterprise organisations. I know that's not necessarily what you're looking at directly today, but a lot of social enterprise organisations do try to tap into to Business mm -hmm. Gateway. That can prove challenging for both service delivery and, and, and for the social enterprises. And that is part of the kind of rural picture, if you like. So if you take, again, the Highlands and Islands, social enterprise models um, are particularly prevalent there and can sometimes find that they don't have access to the sort of business support mm -hmm. in a delivery model that, that, that suits them. Thank you, Convener. Just to follow up on the point, um, and a li perhaps a little bit of background in how Interface fits in with Business Gateway, um, our remit um, from Interface is to support businesses across Scotland to match their business requirements into the world-leading research within universities and colleges for research and development. So we are a national support organisation that are out reaching businesses that perhaps need to translate their requirements into um, research and development or opportunities that universities can actually um, support to lend to development of new products, processes or services. So a direct link between our world leading research within universities into economic output um, through businesses. So we are a small team but we are regionally based so there is a, 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 an opportunity for us to collaborate at a very local level with the business gateway advisors. And so I suppose our target market for businesses are those that are on a growth trajectory, be they start-up or be they more mature businesses. So I suppose from our point of view, in looking across the last particularly three years, we can look to how many, I suppose, referrals we get from Business Gateway teams at a local level. And that gives us a good snapshot of what's happening across, across the country. Um, across the, the national picture, if we look at the number of businesses we have supported over the last three years, 14% of those come through referrals from Business Gateway. 
And I would say that m m many of those referrals are due to personal connections that we have established between my team, which is quite small, it's about 11 people based across the size of Scotland, to um, some of those local offices. So we know that it is personal connections that are making those differences in, in, in identifying the businesses that can really gain from support in, in working with um, our world-leading universities. And so I think what we see is, is very much we have an opportunity to identify where there's really good practice, and that's working with Pamela and colleagues, and then to look at how we can mainstream that across all areas to ensure that there's consistency. I think it's not just for that in working with Interface, it's for other specialist support organisations that are throughout Scotland that we can make sure that, um, as Jan has said, we have a collaborative approach to getting it right for businesses. Okay, Jan Faulkner. Yes, I, I suppose there is a challenge with funding, um, but there's also an op that challenge brings opportunity and that co collaboration is part of it. It's also looking at how we can lever other funds too to bring good value for our clients. Our client base is why we're there and that's what we want to help. We want to help our, our clients through that business through that business stream. Because you know what? The greatest the biggest beneficiary of successful businesses are actually our community and our constituents. So it's well worth us to do that. And what we try to do with what we've got is to be able to sweat our own assets to give more. But the most, most fundamental part of Business Gateway is that one-to-one -one advice. This is where our clients bloom and it's where our advisors, who are really well trained and very well experienced, actually can give added value and that's where we can be able to work out what, they ne what their needs are and to refer them to others. And what is good is to ensure that that re referral comes back and we get feedback and we do do that because we use the national um, customer referral management system, the CRM, which is used not just by Business Gateway but other other Business Gateways and also um, our partners in SE and HI. So a person, a person's business actually has the potential to have quite a great value chain right across the customer journey. Um, I wonder, because I'm, I'm not hearing necessarily clarity about whether the variation, which I think people acknowledge exists, is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm hearing stuff about personal contacts, and I'm starting to hear a bit about finance. So, Graham, you get to bring it all together. Um, you know, you, you're in Glasgow, there's less money. That's self-evident. Um, what difference is that making? What impact is that having on your delivery of Business Gateway? And it is the case that other areas are going up, some are going down. I think it's that tension between having a national brand and, and a, and a localised service and what we're doing in Glasgow. So if you look at the workshop programme, that's open to anybody. Um, so we've had last year, I think, 440 individuals from out with the Glasgow city area attend workshops. So we are trying to be more inclusive, more widely, to, to do away with that postcode lottery. We're working very closely with our partners across the wider city region. City Deal is driving that. So if we use the Tontine Accelerator, for example, we have Lanarkshire businesses that are based in, in uh, Tontine who are receiving support from Business Gateway Interface and other stakeholders that we've tried to bring together. So uh, the point is very well made. I mean, there is tensions between the, the, the localised service and having a national offer that's communicated out to, to the wider business community. And I, I understand the frustrations that that can often bring with businesses not getting the same service across different areas. So the fact that you've had to cut business advisors by a third, yep. um, that has had an impact on your business? It's, had, it's, it's changed our, uh, uh, with any cut or challenge, we, we have to be innovative and we have to look at how we deploy our resources most effectively. And by that, we look across the wider uh, the wider business support network in the city. So if you look at Glasgow, for example, you've got Jobs and Business Glasgow providing advice and guidance to local businesses, local startups, lifestyle businesses. You've got Cultural Enterprise Office who engage extensively with entrepreneurs operating in the creative sector. You have Entrepreneurial Spark. Um, we have three universities that, that offer, offer business support in some way, shape or form to spin-outs. There is a huge amount of support within the city, which I appreciate isn't the same in other areas. So for Glasgow, 
in terms of the resource, we have to manage the most effective way of growing our economy. In 2016, we set quite an ambitious target to be the most productive UK city, UK, uh, city economy in the UK by 2023. For us to achieve that and for the city uh, to, to prosper, we need to look at the way in which our business gateway service offers. Is it the best way to utilise our resources and having engagement with lifestyle businesses that perhaps aren't going to generate the GVA and productivity? Not saying that they're not important to local communities. It's there are other players in the city that are offering that service. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, um, convener. Um, I mean, the term postcode lottery has been used, and I, I don't like that term at all. I, I agree with uh, Pamela there. It implies there's no accountability in any of this. Um, so I don't complain that I'm not getting the same service as I get in France, for example. Um, but there are elements um, of this programme that have already been hinted at are uh, national, have a national profile, so the branding business gateway. The previous panel talked about that word gateway uh, as well, and I think when this was initially... Um, introduced over over 10 years ago, uh, there wasn't the idea that this would be a, a gateway as such. Uh, that, ha that, that, that has grown. Are, are there elements of this service that you do think should be more um, consistently um, uh, identified and delivered so that across the country, so that businesses can be quite clear that this is definitely what you get from Business Gateway um, and everything else will be down to local variation and, 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 and what's deemed appropriate for different economies? So, uh, very good very good question because it is a, an ongoing challenge and it is an area of, an op of opportunity for us. We are trying to work very closely with our national agencies and specifically with Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Government as part of the Enterprise Review and hopefully the Strategic Board. Um, how do we ensure that we have a single portal or a, a one-door approach with no wrong door for brokering um, at a national level? that people can get entry into at a local level, it is a big challenge for us. And the continual clutter that continues to happen on a daily basis, only last week Scottish Government you know, launched three new finance initiatives, not one of them were referred through Business Gateway. Do you know, we, we have challenges on our hands. If national activity continues to be launched without consultation to local authorities and our gateway services, we will continue to have these challenges. So we're up for all these discussions. We want to have a service that declutters, demystifies and makes it easier for businesses to do business at a local level. But to do that, we also have to be at the table and be respected as a, a local authority agencies across Scotland. We deliver support potentially or perceived to 365,000 businesses in Scotland. That's 99% of the business base. We simply don't have the resources, the backup or the finance to do that. But what we can do collectively, working at a collaborative level nationally with partners and at a regional level, is provide a more joined up referral and signposting as well as having our own services to offer. We've been working from a local authority perspective um, as part of our gateway services, leveraging up to um, probably around 14 million of ERDF current programme for SME particularly activity. This has been fundamental to us for the last several years. We've been able to put in gap activity where we've had a, a, a bit of a gap between our business-based ba business services and access to our services through Scottish Enterprise, who we work very actively with. But there was and has been a gap. Um, but to allow us to have these specialist support services and HR employability and e-commerce advisors, perhaps not consistently across Scotland, but where it was needed and where we found that there was evidence for demand. That has been a, that has been a fantastic um, progress for us. How we then start to integrate that with a national agenda is also very important. So yes, we, we do need to look at these opportunities moving forward. Could I just follow up on the question of the Enterprise and Skills Review, because you weren't formally part of that. Um, what, I mean, how much success have you had in terms of making sure that um, Business Gateway is properly recognised within the kind of business support ecosystem, uh, and what are the implications of not having been formally part of that? And, and why why do you think you were not part of that? Well, I suppose it's the it's the the, the everlasting, everlasting question. We we do often say, you know, why is local authorities never consulted at a Scottish government or national perspective when we're asked to deliver ninety percent of the marketplace? It's a question we ask ourselves daily. 
Um, we do try and strive to work nationally and have a one voice, which is why we've you know, we designed Slade to try and make that happen. Um, in terms of the enterprise review, yes, it was very disappointing from a Slade perspective. I can't talk for individual local authorities um, per se, but yeah, we were slightly disappointed, but we have, I suppose, in a, in a funnily term, we've gatecrashed ourselves. So yes, we are at the table in many ways um, through our, either our Gateway National Unit or through our Slade representatives from our executive across our different thematic groups, including business, um, our business group. So we're very now well embedded with the Enterprise Review for our international trade activity, working alongside Scottish Enterprise, SDI and Scottish Chambers. We've now rolled out pilots in Fife and Tayside to deliver trade regional partnerships with all the partners, and they're already proving very well and um, looking to deliver very much joined up support. That is now hopefully linking into where we can start to have discussions with the strategic board, and some of them will be starting next week. Um, so yeah, it's a long way to go. No, we, we, we just keep pushing our corner to say, look, we are here, we're here to work at a collaborative level. Um, you need to understand what's needed at a local level, you need to understand our local priorities, but we are here to support and we're definitely here to collaborate and work with our national partners. Um, just to follow up on your point, I think it's an interesting one, just reflecting back 10 years ago on the actual like, inception and, and the word of, of gateway to be, um, I suppose, that um, one-stop shop support for um, business. And it's interesting when we look at one of the aspirations that has come out of the Enterprise and Skills Review, it is to develop this main online entry portal that will be in place in 2019. And I think it's useful to reflect on how will Business Gateway, how will all of us as, as support, um, business support organisations actually intersect with that online portal? So I think we feel a little bit it's an ever-changing landscape. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, as national services, take into account the um, business that may be based urban, it may be based rurally, how do we best support those businesses? Layer on top of that, is it a female-led in, um, business? Is it a social enterprise? So. It, it is a very um, complex environment, but I think what we have to be all key for is what is the best, what's the customer-centric approach that we can get real strong um, business, um, I suppose, um, support the growth aspirations of all of our businesses. That may mean that we have to make tough decisions. We may have to look at is there a, a kind of basic level of service that can be delivered online and, you know, everybody's used to bu buying flights online. The, the kind of, um, I suppose, um, step change that may be involved may be that people, while they might like face-to-face -face support, there may be aspects that we have to say in Scotland, this is best delivered by a, a different type of service, to then segment to what are the businesses that need that more personalised support that can really drive um, a huge step change in economic growth. Mm -hmm. And these are decisions that it's not just for Business Gateway, I think these have to be a Team Scotland decisions because all of us who are touching businesses need to actually be part of that mix. Um, business Gateway is, as, it's, as we know, works collaboratively with many different other organisations. So to just focus on one of those organisations, be it enterprise, and, uh, enterprise agencies, be it Business Gateway, etc., I'm not sure that's maximising the value out of the collective um, economic purse or public purse in Scotland. Pamela, just, just an example to, to, to bear on from what Siobhan said, and it's, it's quite a good opportune moment to, to, to make reference to some of these things, because I do remember it from the previous panel. Um, we, in terms of how we make efficiencies as our own organisations, as we go out talking to businesses how to do it, we have to do the same thing. Do you know How to become a bit more robust, a bit more agile, a bit more fluid, and particularly more digitally connected to delivering our services. So working with our Business Gateway National Unit and with our economic teams across Scotland, we are fundamentally having to look at how do we deliver and engage with the variety of cohorts of clients that we're asked to engage with, particularly how do we work with young people. They no longer want to attend workshops and talk to us oldies, so to speak. They want everything at the end of this phone. So how do we deliver our services that's 24-7, able to be agile for businesses and young people and entrepreneurs to get access to this? So we are currently working across Scotland with a new web app that was designed originally by our colleagues in Lanarkshire Enterprise Services. We're rolling it out in one or two areas across Scotland, which is now a new app to engage entrepreneurial startups for young people 24-7. It's already proving to be such a success that we're seeing so many applications coming through out with our normal 9-to-5 services. So how do we then do that with our existing businesses and others? And how do we look at having offices and enterprise hubs at local areas that allow us to do that? So 
digital connectivity and how we deliver services is very much a way forward, particularly around the mass scale of workshops that we deliver. How do we make efficiencies there? More sound bites, video, YouTube, etc. So there is opportunity to look at these areas. A comment on that. Uh, you, you were asking about Business Gateway and the kind of the national offer. What what is the offer? Um, and that sort of gateway element. I think also what we can't lose sight of is it's a cluttered landscape for businesses in terms of what is an offer, but also in terms of business at a different at, at different stages in the growth pipeline. Where is it that they you know what does Business Gateway provide to them? Some people don't see Business Gateway as being relevant. To to particular businesses at particular stages, which is a mis misperception, but that's how it can often be perceived. And that middle sort of growth pipeline, those middle businesses can sometimes fall through the net between Business Gateway and then Scottish Enterprise um, and Account Management. And I think we need to really think quite clearly about that. Right, uh, follow up from Jamie Halker Johnson. Um, convenient. It was just actually just on that point. We we've talked quite a lot in this committee about the, uh, when we've had evidence on, on the kind of missing middle. And I just wondered, we've talked here today about the importance of kind of that local impact. Where, where should that missing middle be covered by? Should it be covered in a local aspect through uh, Business Gateway and that kind of local importance, or should it be nationally or a mixture of, of the two? Are you looking at me? Or? Oh, I'm looking at anybody who's happy to give an answer. Um, Pamela, do you want to... I suppose some of the questions you're asking are very much about a national perspective, and um, it is a difficult one. I mean, what local authorities and collectively at strategic level we've been delivering over the last several years is trying to implement and leveraging European funding to deliver that gap in the middle, and successfully so. Um, but how do we do it moving forward when the landscape is continually changing and there's new ways of working, new products coming out, changes being asked of our national agencies? And I think it is a mixture, mm -hmm. but it's about a collaborative mixture. And that's the bit we need to get right that I don't think we have got right. So I think there's a need for our local authorities through our business gateway services to not necessarily be the ones delivering the specialist services. We are not just assigned positions. We do have specialist advisors and a mass of really dedicated, skilled advisors. There's always room for improvement. I'm fully aware of that. But we have to deliver. Now, I, I believe our role is about capacity building. How do we work at a local level to ensure that the businesses we work with have the capacity to have the fundamental business models and access to finance and the right skills to allow them to be more innovative, to internationally trade, at least to trade at a UK and Scot a Scottish and UK level, which currently many of them don't. So there's a mixture between how do we have that enterprise journey in a seamless process that allows the collaborative time so that the businesses don't know who they're getting the steps from per se, but that the, the agencies are all working honestly in a brokering process that allows that seamless transition and conversion of, of economic impact. So it's not an easy one to answer, but I think there is a mixture there, but there's a bit of work still to do. So can I just ask very quickly, so on a practical level, what, what is happening at the moment? What conversations are happening? What, how is that working being done to make sure that, that, that almost that seamless, seamless journey is being done? So I, I, su I suppose let's take internationalisation as, as an example. Um, in the past, I would probably suggest that we've been advised over the years that internationalisation is led by SDI. Absolutely agree. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. However, are businesses at the right stage in their journey to be signposted directly to SDI? No, I don't believe they are. So what do we have a role to do from an economic business gateway perspective? So our behaviours and cultures have to change. We have to ensure that we do work more effectively with these businesses to ensure that they are fit for purpose and they're at the right stage in their business to be signposted and to bring in our specialists from other agencies to support that journey further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm happy to share a very practical example with you and how um, we've worked with Business Gateway to support an innovative company. Um, and for us, you know, with having um, staff, for Business Gateway, having staff based in 57, you know, local offices, there are eyes and ears on the ground to essentially spot mm -hmm. companies that can really, um, I suppose, are on a journey of, of innovation. Some of them may be very mature businesses, they may be family-owned businesses, or they may at very early start-up stage. So in a practical example, um, one of the companies that was referred to us by Business Gateway was a fruit and veg wholesaler from Fife. Now, um, you know, that, that particular company wouldn't be touched by enterprise agencies, it's a yeah. fruit and veg wholesaler. But actually the um, lead company co um, managing director had a fantastic idea that based on food, le food legislation, 
um, there needed to be a development of new practices and how to stop starch going down waste drains. So essentially from potato peelings, because these services fish and chip shops, um, there was a real problem with food and drink legislation that was emerging. Now the Business Gateway um, advisor was keen to help that company, but knew that they hadn't got the knowledge or the skill sets to be able to understand how to address his, um, his idea. And so we were able to come and work alongside the Business Gateway to identify relevant expertise within University of Abertay. That's now led to a new company being formed called Peeltech. Um, they've actually taken on the resource from Abertay University to head up the new business. And that's now looking at international exports. So it's a real success story of how co-working can really bring a, an idea in somebody's head really to life and, and drive um, growth in the economic area. But equally well, we have companies that perhaps approach us first that we can then refer back into Business Gateway or to other um, organisations within the sport landscape to actually get assistance. So go back to the point, I think it is about the network of advisors that are touching businesses. It is so important that that network of advisors understand each other's missions. Because other than that, we kind of get perhaps competition happening among one another. But all of us need to have a very clear mission and be very well skilled to understand how to deliver that particular mission. And then that interconnectivity can happen. But I don't doubt that for a business, it can be a very complex landscape. So it's how do we, as the business support organisations, ensure that we are all joined up. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, if, if I or, or we as the committee want to compare what is happening in Business Gateway around the country, I suppose the first question is, is that actually possible? You know, if I want to compare Dumfries and Galloway and what Business Gateway is doing there and Glasgow and Fife and yesterday some of us were in Lanarkshire, can I make that comparison and how can I make that comparison? I think it's very difficult to do that. I think it's very difficult to, to, to compare um, comparatively. Uh, so the, the economic landscape in Dumfries and Galloway is very different from what it is in, in Glasgow. Um, I don't think there's any, any question around that. We heard from the previous panel um, around the issue around metrics and, and, and that the, the difference between targets and, and, and measurable output. Um, and I think we really need to, uh, if there's something that we can take forward and, and, and really work on, is, is the way in which we measure our, our output. Align it potentially with national data in terms of what the ONS produce. Um, because there is tension between startup figures uh, or core business figures um, and the wider economic impact that that has. So it is very difficult to, to, to compare and contrast. I can stick with Glasgow for a minute and I'll Please come back do. to other people. Um, I mean, one, in your submission, you say historical data shows that business gateway performance in the city has no direct correlation to economic growth. I mean, that's quite a major statement and almost might suggest we could have growth without business gateway. Uh, I mean, in your the table three, which you have, uh, talks about volume start, which I take it is the number of businesses starting up, has fallen from 1,001 to 407, and other people have highlighted that. Can you give us any kind of explanation of that, and how, how is that different from other local I'd, authorities? I'd be delighted to. I mean, you, you heard from the previous panel around the issues of engagement and, and the level of engagement, um, the tension between churning through numbers and figures for statistics versus the depth and quality of engagement and what businesses actually need. In Glasgow, what we've done is invested quite heavily in the skills of our business advisors to ensure that they're equipped to, to deal more deeply with businesses across the range of issues that they face, whether it be internationalisation, whether it be people, whether it be operations, finance, so that we have that core baseline knowledge to be able to work more closely. Now, by doing that, that takes up more time by the very nature of, of that job. So that was a conscious decision that we took to do that. I guess the point that, that we were making through, through that is that business gateway engagement, while that has, that has dropped significantly, it hasn't had a, an impact on the city performance. And that's because business gateway has been brought in and integrated within the wider economic development landscape within the city. So, Going back to your question about 
the, the, the comparison between Dumfries and Galloway. I think that's the tension between a local service um, and, and having that that national brand that is the old, you know that is the standard service. What we're doing at a local level is trying to integrate that to have a more robust economic impact. Integration, but I mean, how can you then measure what is Business Gateway in Glasgow doing? I mean, have you got? Do you set your own targets or? What do you measure? What are the outturns? What are the outputs? We do. We, we, we measure it based on GVA, jobs, productivity. That, that's the measures that we use. Yes, we align it with and, and, and we work with the national unit in terms of setting targets against a uniform of, of uh, metrics. Is there improvements to be made there? I think there are. Uh, is it accurately reflecting the performance in Glasgow versus, for example, Dumfries and Galloway? I don't think it does. Um, going back to the earlier point about lifestyle businesses and, and, and businesses that perhaps don't generate economic growth, um, if we direct our business gateway resource to that, we're not growing, we're not aligning it with the wider economic strategy. So yes, by the very nature, it would increase those figures in terms of the number of businesses engaged with. The other, the other factor here is that during that period between 2010 and 2017, Business Gateway came into the Council. Prior to that, it was subcontracted out. And I'll refer back to the previous panel where there was debate around the performance of um, subcontracted Business Gateway services and the, and the targets and the way in which targets are achieved through financial uh, incentives. Um, by removing that, we've allowed ourselves to focus more closely on what is it that businesses actually need, concentrating on the skills and experience of our business advisors and integrating that more fully across the wider economic um, landscape. Okay, well, I can maybe widen it out to the others as well. I mean, last, the last panel I told them I was confused. I think, I think this time I'm, I'm feeling a little frustrated that is there no measure we can use to, to somehow see how the different business gateways are doing and, and maybe the a start-ups is the wrong measurement, but is it GVA and is that too vague, Ms Faulkner? I think, um, I've been looking at this and on a um, local level, going into ward level, and if I just looked at the numbers and the targets that we have, I don't think that would be smart. What we try to do is take the context of the businesses in that particular area and then bump it up higher for the region. So we've only recently, in Dumfries and Galloway, started doing this because prior it was just a um, report on the region's success rather than looking at particular areas. Um, for ourselves, it's been a learning curve because essentially, well, more than a learning curve, it's been a sharing curve because we've known what's been happening in particular areas and the types of businesses, some of them we won't have startups because we've got growing businesses who want to grow. And if we do get startups, they may come in just for a small amount of time, but they may decide to be lifestyle businesses or d decide, I quite like doing what I want to do and I don't want to grow. I just want to be a, I want to be a business and earn, earn a living, thank you, and leave us. That is fine. We have other areas near bigger conurbations where we've got very ambitious businesses, maybe a few, but they are, are ambitious. So it's contextual. So I don't think you can just look at a number nationally and say, oh, ho, yeah, we've got 9,000 new bu businesses. What we need to know is, are these businesses, what are the ones that are going to grow and how they're going to grow? So I think we need to mine below the numbers. Mm. I, I mean, I, I totally to get the contextual point, and I, I, I do. I've got a lot of sympathy with what you're saying, but then I just wonder, well, how? I mean, if we take, say, like yourselves and say Ayrshires or something like that, um, I mean, how do you know? Are they doing something better than you? Are you doing something better than them? How do they can compare? Because if everything's contextualised, we can't make any comparisons, can we? Well, I, I think that if I look at it at a, at a local level, I can make a comparison. I can I can see which areas do well because I know that I've got rural areas where they're generating um, value-added products, and I can explain that, and I can comp explain that in GVA. I have others that are, are doing other products. I believe that we need to understand the c context behind it to, under to see that there are some things that we will not do because there are others that do it better than us. 
that is, and that is the biggest challenge. I also think we're challenged with our targets. Um, I'm not one for for following targets. I know those targets are there. I want to see outcomes. I want to see businesses that do well. And if that means higher productivity and we have to measure using GVA, well, we'll have to do that okay. because I think that would be a fairer way of seeing having a good baseline and showing success. OK, because thanks. 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 Ms Reid? Um, I think you can um, research and consult, and this is what we do. We evaluate the impact of, of various programmes. I do think you can. Um, assess the impact. I would be looking at doing, looking at the quantitative data, but un undeniably, you need to look at the regional context, the local context. You need to look at a whole range of other other factors, like the different models that are that, that are being used in the different areas. What I would say is that you absolutely have to go to the businesses that, that are supported, because the key thing here is, are the businesses in the areas getting the support that they need within their context and are they able to access that support and you would build that up into a national picture. I would imagine you'd be, whilst of course you want to look at how each area is performing, actually the best use of doing this work would be to learn the lessons from across the different areas, the different models, the different ways that Business Gateway is, is operating. So I would be less inclined to present it as a comparison and more as a kind of evaluation to inform the future development across business gateway locally, regionally and nationally. I think, But I think, in answer to your question, it can be done, mm -hmm. okay. in my Thank view. You. Ms Stevenson. So, um, from a, a national slate perspective, um, probably just to articulate, we do have a fairly robust performance framework in place for economic development across Scotland and for our business gateway performance. Um, we do have a comparable benchmarking set of families across our local authorities that support what we do. Um, in terms of data, we collect data from a ward level to a local level to a regional level and a national level. All of this information from Gateway specifically does go into our dashboards that's then evidenced and set within the context and provided table to our business gateway boards. It's also put in our yearly slate economic indicators, achievements and um, performance review, which gets launched and um, campaigned at the end of November of the year, which goes to ministers, civil servants and stakeholders alike. Um, all that in the public domain? Absolutely is. Um, and that goes out every year and has been for the last several years. And ministers actually come along to our Slade conference, which will be end of November, early December, to make reference to the key achievements delivered through our gateway performance, which also showcases local activity, national activity, and our wider, importantly, wider economic development activity. OK, thank you. OK, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Convener. Um, the previous panel, and I think you probably heard a fair bit of what they were talking about, were not particularly um, excited with the quality of the information coming out about uh, Business Gateway locally, what sort of targets and how the targets are monitored, measured and evaluated. I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Do we have adequate monitoring? Do we have adequate evaluation of Business Gateway in the present uh, format? Um, so, yes, we do. Um, very, very structured monitoring process in place through our dashboards. But why did the previous panel think something different? And I'll, if you let me finish, I'll probably okay. explain to you. Um, I am very frustrated with the responses, but I'm also very frustrated that we're obviously not getting the message out effectively. So yes, I think from our business gateway board and our Slade activity, we obviously are not working still collectively with the national agencies and our key stake stakeholders to understand what we are achieving and how we actually monitor and deliver our services because there is stats to say this. So we need to actually probably review how we're delivering our communication strategy at a national level more effectively to ensure that the likes of the members around this room understand what we do and then actually can scrutinise it a bit more effectively. So we're happy to take that back and look at opportunities to work more effectively with our national stakeholders to make that happen. In terms of a model where Business Gateway has been taken in-house by the Council, who actually is the, is the person or persons that say, right, you know, They've met their targets. Or, you know, they're responsible for monitoring it. They're responsible for that evaluation. Where does the buck stop? I take it to committee, and it's agreed by council. I have to front up 
every every quarter to area committee to explain what's happening and why it's happening. Uh, if things aren't going well, um, then we're challenged to get it sorted. Um, we're given suggestions as well as professionals. We usually turn up with an action plan, which uh, you would do. But but in the main, it's through our um, it's through our council governance, which I believe really works, and this is why I'm very supportive that it is COSLA that does oversee this because it means that you have all the council leaders there who see the results, who are able to know their backgrounds because they've been well um, reported and uh, on the, from their local from their local um, economic development services through the directorates and they will own it because they will know what's happening from a ward level right through to a regional level. But given the nature of local government, given the nature of uh, councils, there is a limited uh, skill in business. Um, how, do you, how do you tap in to get that uh, entrepreneurial skill so that the evaluation has got a quality to it. Many, well, my um, my staff and myself, and there are many members within our um, council who are uh, business people. I will also say we have business people represented as local members. Uh, I, I do believe that we're very fortunate because we do work in a collective and we can get other advice. We work with the SE. Um, I, I don't come from a public sector background. I actually come from a business background in New Zealand. And um, so I would say that if you're working in e economic development and you don't have an entrepreneurial spirit, you shouldn't be in it. But I certainly am, and I know that my colleagues are. I'm glad my MBA um, didn't, yes. didn't really hold merit moving into the public sector. But um, I, having worked in t over 15 years in, in higher education, you know, research data is something that, that within um, within Glasgow certainly is something that we, we look at very closely, we monitor. We, similar to colleagues in Dumfries and Galloway, report that through the, to, to the, the appropriate committee structures and, and through the convener for economic growth, which is the leader of the council. So that reporting mechanism is within, within the council is, is very robust and um, we're accountable to, to, to them. I suppose at a, a wider level uh, for Business Gateway, we report into the national unit. The national unit have a role in terms of um, uh, collating and, and analysing the, the data on a national level. Uh, as we've already discussed this morning, the, the challenge of that is the consistency across areas and um, definitely um, something that can be improved on, as Pamela alluded to. Looking at the, the governance side, um, the previous panel seemed to agree that uh, there was, by backing Business Gateway into the local government, that they had become somewhat isolated from, for example, groups like Scottish Enterprise. How do you think that, how, how would you say about that? I can speak from a Glasgow perspective. We work very closely with colleagues uh, in Scottish Enterprise. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, we have the, the, the City Region City Deal um, project, uh, the accelerator, at, the business accelerator at Taunting. SE have a presence here, as does Interface, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we've, we've created and worked very hard with colleagues in Scottish Enterprise to develop those links and to continue working with them. Is there more that we can do? Absolutely. Um, we, we're uh, moving um, very strongly in a regional direction. We're working much, much more closely uh, on a regional basis. Um, and that's some, something that we'll continue to do. But in terms of Scottish Enterprise, we, we have a very good relationship and work very closely with them. And I'm sure Pamela will add to that. So yeah, again, it's, it's, it's a complex ecosystem out there and it becomes quite challenging for us to, to, to make sure we are integrated with a lot of our national agencies. However, we work extremely close and as proactively as we possibly can with our SE colleagues, SDI, SMAS colleagues, Scottish Manufacturing. It's important, it's vital that we get access to these national services to ensure that our local businesses get to build their capacity. You know, Scottish Manufacturing are so effectively working with the local authorities and our gateway client, our gateway advisors, because it's all part of the rationale for for um, diversifying some of our sectors, for looking at our sectors around innovation and um, streamlining and for competitiveness, particularly around Industry 4.0. So it's fundamental we work with them. SE, we work very closely with their workforce development teams, 
um, now called Workplace Innovation, um, and obviously with their innovation and their internationalisation teams, and in particularly with some of their um, teams around leadership as well. So there's lots going on. It's just, I think the challenge is just how we get all that noted out there. There's so many things, and we've got evidence that shows that, that you know, across 30, 32 local authorities, 18 lead areas, there's some fantastic, um, whether it's, at, it's centric, at city centric or at rural level, fantastic projects happening in collaboration with a variety of national agencies. It's just trying to get that national message out there and perhaps is something we do need to, to, to take a bit more time on. And I suppose to try and link these two questions together, there's an interesting kind of dimension where we are trying to work more collaboratively to actually, um, I suppose, get the right right specialist advice to the company at the right place in time. But equally well, all of us that have got indicators to respond to from our funders, and we have funding from Scottish Funding Council, SE and High, all of us also equally well have to show our individual contribution, be it for our measure, it's GVA and the number of products and processes and services. But if you ask a business, success is many masters, so they won't be able to distinguish perhaps, you know, if I go back to the Ivan Wood and Sons case study there, will Ivan credit Business Gateway with referring into Interface? Will he credit Abertay University? Will he credit, credit SDI who's given him a global platform? So I think that whole, you know, how do we, how do you, you, you know, kind of look at the additionality of each individual service versus actually the business see it as a continuum of a journey? And I think, again, that's a key question that we can't. We have to work together collaboratively to make the best use of our assets that we have. But equally well, how we actually measure that becomes quite problematic, given we're all working off individual KPIs and all have to maximise and show the best for our GBA. Thank you. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I've, I've just quickly had a look at the Slade Indicator Framework Report, and the last one I can see there is for 2015-16. Is that the, the most up-to-date report that's online? Yes, it's 17-18 comes out in about two weeks. Right, OK. And Couple that will be sent to all Scottish Government. Right. Um, one thing I was going to ask, just having quickly looked at the figures, um, there is a chart of the number of business gateway support interventions. Um, and it seems to suggest that over a, th over a third of local authorities have intervened in less than 100 cases. Would that be right? Um, I'm not sure if I could accurately um, agree to that or um, confirm that. As I say, that. I've only just came across it just now. So. I do have some stats I'm happy to, yeah? to take you mm -hmm. through, and that might be able to correlate with a stat that I don't recognise that you've been given. So in 17-18, obviously, um, we, we've helped... Um, 53,000 people plan to start their new business um, or issues are running and growing their businesses. Um, we've had um, 31, over 31,000 people who've asked for support. 10,000, over 10,000 people attended workshops to improve their business skills, um, of which 9,000 businesses, I'm sure you're already aware, have started support. 47% 47, 47% of that, of course, is female startups. Um, over 17,000 inquiries coming through our businesses. Um, and over 15,000 business owners attended workshops. Um, we've also supported over 3,000 growth clients in 1718. And again, we're working with many clients under the new Scottish Government's Digital Boost. Mm. So the number of hundreds assist to me doesn't resonate with our, our I'm figures. I'm just reading off one of the my own five pages. geographics, so. Right, okay. I mean, obviously we need to have a, a a more proper look at it, but since yeah. you mentioned it, I, I just pulled it up and I quite Yeah, look happy it. To, to take it as an action, sir. Okay. Um, and if, if all of this information is available, why are we hearing that um, there is a lack of transparency and also that there is no published data in order to identify what Business Gateway um, is spending their money on and its impact? So, um, not to talk out of turn of the, the witnesses from the previous panel, but I think I may like to add my two penneth. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the concerns have been perhaps frustration from a national perspective. We have very robust information that goes through COSLA to our leaders. We have that same information at a local regional level go to our local areas. And we have the same information that goes in through our Slade performance indicators, which is currently being reviewed to improve that whole productivity capability mm -hmm. rather than just about targets. 
We used to deliver back in the transition days of 2008-9 um, when Scottish Enterprise transferred over business gateway support. We had, and I was involved in some of the national activity at the time, we had what was called a business gateway stakeholder group. Um, that group has no longer met for, for several years, and I think that group um, consisted of the likes of Scottish Enterprise, mm. FSB, the Chambers, etc. And I think they liked that platform to give them some consultation and input into their interpretation and wishes of how they would like to see Business Gateway delivered. Mm -hmm. However, as Business Gateway has been more delivered in-house by the local authorities, that probably hasn't been the same opportunity to do that. Again, it's back to, you know, happy to look at these things, you know, what can we do at a national level to work consult in consultation? But I don't really think it's about just all these national agencies dictating and coming to tell us what we have to do with local authority and Business Gateway. I think it should be a bit more respectful and a bit more joined up. So when do we actually get to come to the table and discuss from a national perspective our SE, or FSBs, or Scottish Chambers and where we feel that there's opportunities to work more effectively together. So I think it is an area we need to probably yeah. have a look at again and refresh and get a bit closer to, to FSB and the mm. Chambers because there is some fantastic things happening across the local areas. But perhaps at that national policy governance level with some mm. of these representatives, there needs to be a bit more probably consultation. Just on that last point that you mentioned um, about there has to be more consultation across the, the agencies mm -hmm. and the fact that the, the previous uh, arrangements no longer exist. Um, how do you currently share best practice? You, you mentioned earlier on about uh, Lanarkshire having a really good app that was now being rolled out. I mean, h how do you share best practice that happens across all the business gateways if the forum that previously existed no longer exists? So that was an external stakeholder forum. We mm -hmm. have a fantastic and have done since we transferred in 2008 a business gateway operational network, you may have heard the acronym and be gone, um, that delivers our core contract of activity and has done all these 10 years. Um, and it's a superb um, set of, of team working to deliver best practice, to discuss the contracts over the years, to look at opportunities to improve, help each other look at benchmarking and particularly help each other with how we've had the challenges and opportunities where we've changed the contracts, we've decided to review elements of the, the market that was middle that was missing in the middle. So back four or five years ago, we then delivered this new business-based activity around um, the, the growth advisory services, but also how we support each other, helping look at changing the contract structures from outhouse to in-house, commercial to non-commercial. And it's been beneficial. So we have a fantastic group of, of representatives across the local authorities, economic development teams that come together to support just that core part of Business Gateway. And then it's around working with Slade Business Group, some of the same representatives are on that group, to then see how we, t we look to integrate the gateway, the gateway operations across our wider economic development services. And in terms of the Slade indicators that are there, what are the key indicators we should be looking at to if we're trying to measure if Business Gateway provides uh, value for money? So I suppose we do have the, the main core gateway um, targets. Um, we, the jury's probably out in terms of we are looking to review these, but from a wider Slade perspective... No, we, how we, challenging are those targets? Um, I suppose how long is a piece of string? It's, it's a difficult one. We, we, can make the, we can deliver the targets. It's not about delivering the targets for us. It's about the quality behind the targets that's important to us. Um, mm. I think we're all fully aware, and we've raised this at the Business Gateway Scotland Board recently, that we have to review the performance targets for Business Gateway. We don't think they're probably right for the, the current environment. It's not just about how many clients we can get into the different levels of segmentation that can access SE services. It's about the actual delivery of productivity, innovation, trade behind it, inclusivity, um, and particularly access to finance. And I think Liz referenced it in the previous panel, what we're also looking to do as part of our KPIs is we have to benchmark and we have to review better how we are showcasing the level of support that Business Gateway is doing to signpost to other referral agencies. So I think that's important that we do understand the level of engagement in that, that process. Do you want me to come back to the other, your question about the performance or... Yeah, yeah, that would be helpful. 
So again, it's just looking at that whole performance. Some of the measures we do is how do we, from an economic perspective, have this performance indicator that we have a performance group who, um, led by one of our colleagues from Dundee City Council, fantastic group looking at the whole leverage of activity across the economic agencies. And I think we have probably something like 495 million of budget going across the 32 local authorities' economic development and some 1,600 staff working in these services that includes the gateway support. So how do we measure more effectively the access to finance, investment, infrastructure, access to procurement opportunities, supply chain, improvements around employment land? I could go on. There's, there's lots we do. So the Slade indicators actually identifies that. And there's still room for improvement. I'm sure you'll probably see that when you yeah. see them come out in two weeks. But um, it's we do have some, some fantastic and figures. Just just my final points, and I'll roll the two questions together for to widen it out to everybody else. We heard the, this morning and in previous evidence that the business support landscape is a complex and cluttered. Uh, so, one, what efforts have been made in order to provide the one-stop shop that businesses are looking for? And secondly, um, given this cluttered landscape, is there any gaps in that support that need to be filled that currently aren't being met? I'm happy to start. Um, um, yes, indeed. And, and I think the whole premise around the Enterprise and Skills Review started with that, you know, mm -hmm. cluttered landscape, what yeah. can we do? So there is no um, doubting that um, businesses do find it very confusing to navigate that landscape. Escape. There is a whole slew of recommendations that have emerged from the um, strategic framework of the Enterprise and Skills um, Board. So I think there. We, we need that journey to start in terms of some of that, but it can't be, it can't be without excluding, for example, Business Gateway and other organisations that are developing, de um, delivering specialist services. So I think that's one key point is we are at the beginning of another um, set of um, recommendations or actions taking place. So what that looks like or making sure that those recommendations actually do lead to less complexity is going to be hugely important. Um, I think the second point around gaps to be filled, mm -hmm. you know, we've heard about um, whether um, particular businesses want specialist advice or they want a blended approach. And I think, you know, we could talk about, we've talked quite a lot about um, supporting women-led businesses, we can talk about social enterprises, etc. So every business would pro it finds and um, considers themselves unique. So it's how can we, though, maximise that feeling of uniqueness for them but actually against the affordability that we have. Right. Okay. A one-stop portal is really vital that, um, that everyone can use that is backed up by our good CRM as well. Also to be able to showcase what we do have and I had a quick look at our own website and we actually didn't showcase a couple of great things that we have like our um, women in business network that we have, like um, the, the really good digital boost program. We've got it there, but we don't actually explain it. And that would help signpost people. The gap that I see that we do have, it is for the medium-sized businesses. The businesses that do want to grow, and they have established, but where do they go? They're, they're not right for um, SE, and, and they may not think that they could come to Business Gateway, but actually they can. And we really, we can, we, if we were really clever, we would wrap them up in the wraparound that the council services actually get, deliver, the ones that they're statutorily obliged to deliver, as in planning, as in environmental health, as in trading standards. And we would have the right people giving the right advice at the right time. So that's maybe one of the challenges, not so much a business gateway part, but an economic development and council challenge to make sure that we're thinking about the business's needs all the way through and directing them to the right people. And directing them to Business Gateway would be a lot smarter than directing them to a mere amateur who wouldn't even know what they're doing. So maybe a lot of it is not just engaging with our partners and making certain they know what we do, but engaging with the people we work with every day and yourselves so you know what Business Gateway can do for business. 
Sorry, I was just going to I was just going to echo the point. It is a cluttered landscape. We we understand that. We recognise that. We're working very closely with Scottish Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland, particularly in Glasgow, um, and, and and at a regional level. And and there's definitely efficiencies that we can that we can make. Okay, okay. Uh, Angela Constance. Thank you, Convener. The panel will have heard the discussion um, earlier about how the business support network um, you know, perhaps needs to find uh, different and better ways to reach out to underrepresented groups in terms of you know, encouraging more uh, you know, women-led uh, start-ups. But there's also other underrepresented groups in terms of people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, people uh, living with uh, disabilities, uh, young people um, and people from a, a black and minority uh, ethnic background. So I'm quite interested to hear from those that are closest to the front line what you're currently doing, what's working well, what's not working um, so well, and also whether you had um, any view on the suggestion that, uh, for example, in terms of supporting women, that there needs to be a, a national policy-driven uh, approach. And I think I would like to start with Ms. Ms. Faulkner, if that was all right. I'm very impressed with the work that's done in Dumfries and Galloway, working with um, with like-minded women. Uh, the the group that we do have there, I had the pleasure of spending time with them, and you begin to see what added value they can do. Uh, that they have very innovative ways of undertaking so solutions and very solution focused. Um, we also have a very um, a very buoyant and, and good skills and empl employability team who tend to work more with disadvantaged groups and disadvantaged people. And looking at, at our scope, I think that we can use, first of all, make certain that people have access to the business gateway information and what it can do for individuals who may want to set up their own business through skills and employability, but also working with other public sector partners who do work with those groups and work with them a lot better than we do and make and make certain that they, they know what we're doing and that's through our community uh, our, our community partnerships that we have. Our local our local community partnerships can bring so much more. We work together in our local um, uh, improvement plans. It would be much better to bring people in in a natural way than sort of saying point blank, okay go and see your disadvantaged groups, because that's not the way to do it. These groups emerge. We have creative groups. We have uh, different, different sector groups who may or may not want to have their own businesses. Um, in rural areas, it's very, very challenging, and we have more social enterprises who want to be enterprising businesses. So it depends on the sectors of the particular area. A city will be quite different from a rural area, which will be quite different from islands. And so it needs to be naturally done, but using the networks that we always already have. Can I just follow that up quickly, Ms Faulkner? If, for example, uh, women are receiving less support uh, from the, the business support uh, network than their male peers, um, how specifically would you address that? First of all, I would need the measure measurement. I don't have the measurement and I don't know whether they are or not. I did read the document, but I didn't know where that measurement came from. I'm unaware um, and I'd have to go through, I would have to do some research and get some research done, but I don't have that information to my fingertips to see that there are disadvantaged groups that are not getting the level of support that they needed. Hence why I answered the question the way that I did, because I am unaware of it. It doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist, but I don't have that information. Okay, I mean, we've touched upon the issue about lack of data and information uh, earlier. I just wondered, Mr Smith, from your Glasgow experience, if there was anything you wanted to bring to the table. Yeah, there's, there's four points that I would like to make. First of all, we've got a, a dedicated BME advisor that engages uh, widely with the um, ethnic minority community and does extensive work in, in going out and, and trying to support the growth of businesses and, and generate new start businesses. Um, so that's the first thing. Second one, we have a, a very successful women in business program that's been going for a number of years now, um, very well established and, and highly effective. Um, 
Uh, in addition to that, um, we in Glasgow uh, have uh, a very strong focus on so social enterprises um, and uh, through the Glasgow Partnership for Economic Growth and bringing Business Gateway uh, into that, we're working with uh, social enterprise partners in the city to, to grow the business base uh, to ensure that we've got that inclusive growth dimension that, that's organic and, and, and growing within the city. Um, it's maybe one for Pamela, and, and, and I know that, that colleagues elsewhere, we're, we're, we're also looking at supported businesses and how we can most effectively engage with supported businesses to help um, support them in recruiting and retaining uh, individuals and, and staff with disabilities. Um, so those are those are four examples of, of what we're doing, um, and I'm sure Pamela will, will have something to add, unless there's something you want to follow up on. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, Stevenson, if you could perhaps address the point about the, the balance between a local and nationally driven policy, particularly with regards to advanced inequalities. Okay. Um, so, first of all, just on the activity around what we are doing at local and national level, do you know some short of 50,000 2017-18 employability participants were engaged in economic services and just short of 17,000 people were supported into work? Um, I've got quite a lot of the stats, in fact, from the 18 lead local authorities. So, Jan, I do have your, your data here, <laughs> if you don't. Um, and there is a variety of fantastic programmes going on for Syrian refugees, for migrant workers, for women-led activities, for particularly working with Scottish Enterprise and SDS around our pay support for task force, for recovery of mass scale redundancies, um, translation services, and I think, as Graham rightly said, some of the work we do around supported businesses, particularly around our local and national policies for procurement and collaboration and how we engage through our local authorities-led supply development programme, which is a national programme delivered by all our local authorities, that really does have a role around how do we engage our local potential um, equalities around um, collaboration and community benefits. So we're working on how do we deliver alternative community benefits, not just from an employability perspective, but how do we ensure some of our community groups also get access through social enterprises and community enterprises, access to some of the, the public sector funds and the breakdown of some of the lots of um, supplies of our services across the regional and national agencies. In terms of policy, we do not have from a Slade or a Business Gateway contract policy on how we interpret and deliver our startup services, say, for, for women or engagement. It's a mainstream service. We do have 47% of women's stats from 1718. That's fantastic. Lots of women, fantastic women's programmes going on. In fact, I and others all attended the Women's Enterprise Scotland Awards last week. Um, what we are currently doing um, in, in line with what we feel maybe is a gap and how we work more effectively with Women's Enterprise Scotland, rather than having people reinvent at a national level. Um, our gateway team through our business gateway operational network are currently, as we speak, um, looking to pull together a brief to produce a national business gateway women's-led programme that we can look at in collaboration with our national agencies, but not in isolation of all the other inclusivity requirements needed and it's you know what is the priority for us and we do need to have some of these further discussions with some of these national groups um what is the priority we can't do it all so what one do we do we address and how do we make sure that we have local services to do it and if not how do we work with our national support agencies to come into our regions to support us and provide their skills to deliver these things okay thank you thanks Kevin. thank you very much very briefly from dean lockhart Thank you, Convener. Just had a couple of uh, supplementals based on what we've heard. Let me wrap them up together. The first is um, on targets, the, because Scottish Government figures show that Business Gateway invested £12.6 last year in startups, which is the lowest level since 2009. So I'd like to get uh, some brief ideas or thoughts as to what's behind uh, the decline. Was it primarily budget cuts? And the second question relates to e-commerce. We heard from the previous panel that Scotland uh, is far behind the rest of the UK in terms of using e-commerce. Um, I'd like to get your views on do your organisations have the necessary skill set to help businesses uh, develop e-commerce? For example, do you have a dedicated team uh, that is looking at e-commerce? Thank you. Um, as for e-commerce, we have uh, an expert person in there. We, we also bring an additional resource for, for e-commerce. Um, with respect to uh, the decline in, um, in start-ups, um, 
that investment. I'm not certain where that ha comes from. I know that we have made a small amount of savings, but we also invest a lot of um, staff time and use other resources. What I do know that uh, I still have the same staff complement, and we do we do assist each other and work together to help our startups. But it's more than just startups; it's also growing businesses that we invest and support in. To answer the, the budget implications, um, I, I'm not here today from Slade's perspective to talk about local authorities' financial positions. I can share with you the, the, some of the information we have around all of the local authorities in terms of budget savings, not from a, a, a number, qualified number, but particularly around the impact and across all of the lead areas and some of the other local authorities. There has been budget savings made over the last couple of years. Um, in the main, and I mean in the main, majority is saying that it has not made any difference to the impact on services. Some of it has actually been because the efficiencies have come from bringing it from outhouse to in-house. There has not really been a reduction in services. And in some cases, the money that we do have to deliver gateway services has been instrumental in delivering and supporting the successful programmes of our SME competitiveness, um, allowing us to access up to 14 million using about a 34 million budget pot of expenditure to deliver additional services to lever in more impact into the gateway services. From an e-commerce perspective, um, e-commerce has always been fundamental to delivery of local activity from Business Gateway, even back to when we had our Scottish Enterprises First e-commerce first steps programme that was always embedded in our gateway services back to even 2003. Um, our Digital Boost Programme that's led by our Business Gateway National Unit, which is receiving umpteen awards. It's a fantastic programme. I hope everyone agrees across Scotland. Hopefully the government will help us continue it moving into 1920. But this has actually really allowed us to work with our local businesses to capacity build them to understand that having great broadband and access to connectivity is not the same as having digital technical solutions that makes them competitive. So having these additional programmes has allowed us to work more advanced with some of our businesses to stimulate, to raise awareness, but also to have that one-to-one -one ICT e-commerce and digital solutions support to work with our business gateway um, clients to get them to understand how they have to be competitive and the solutions. Government have just introduced and launched, I believe about a week ago, a new digital loan fund um, that we're hopeful as well will work in tandem with some of the work we're doing with our digital boost to allow businesses to access um, a commercial loan to allow them to look at the capital investment needed to become more digital, to become more competitive. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. I appreciate it's a bit difficult to try and get in what you might want to say on issues, and sometimes you don't have the facts or figures to hand, so uh, to all of the witnesses, please feel free to write in to provide any supplemental comment you wish to or to respond to a question where you don't feel you've had the time to uh, fully answer it. Um, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for your time. Um, we'll allow a few minutes for the witnesses to leave, then we'll move to the next item of business directly. The uh, further item of business, which is item three, a consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to the proposed UK statutory instrument, the Renewables Obligation Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. The notification suggests that this is a Category A proposal, in other words, a technical one with a minimum policy choice or only one obvious policy solution. So the UK government proposes to amend the order to remove references to the UK being a member state 
and to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, equally, references to the role of the European Commission will, of course, no longer apply and therefore fall away. The actual legislation will continue to function exactly as it does now. So the question is, is the committee content for these matters to be dealt with by statutory instruments laid at Westminster? Uh, if the committee is content, I will write to the Minister for Energy, Connectivity and the Islands to notify him of the committee's decision. Agreed. All content. Thank you. We'll now uh, move to private session.